Great. Then uh, I call to order uh, this meeting of the Amherst Pollen Regional School Committee at what looks to be around 6.34, maybe 6.35. Apologize for the 6.34. Apologize for the delay. Uh, and I hope also uh, everyone's been able to make it here safely. I hope they get home safely. And uh, depending on how efficient we are, we'll hopefully try to find a way to get people out while paying appropriate attention to all the important work we have to do. Uh, with that, uh, I would seek approval of the minutes of December 12th and December 20th uh, that are in your packet. I move to accept the minutes that are in our packets. Okay, is it, is it moved, in, moved? Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, yes? Just one minor uh, correction mm -hmm. on the notes of December 12th under the second heading, public comment and approved minutes. Uh -huh. I believe that Elisa Melnick, who's a community member, uh, her name is misspelled. It should be a Y instead of an I. I think you're right. Um, any Anyone else reading this, hopefully, as closely as, as it only is this? Anything further? If not, uh, um. Yes, please. Oh, I'm sorry. It's Mary. Yeah. Just to so find, where I, are you? Okay. So, sorry, it took me to find it. Um, minutes of um, the 12th. Okay. Um, section B. Yes. Um, so, towards the bottom there, like maybe five lines from the bottom. Okay. Um, Ms. Bodie noted that concerns about equity are pervasive, particularly in the math department. Mm -hmm. And I remember this, I remember this part, and to me that kind of doesn't quite represent the intent, I think, of what she was trying to say, which was, I think, attention to um, equity or something along those lines is pervasive in the I think school. that I think so. that is true. I believe her message was we are paying attention to this issue and are concerned about it and focused on it. Not that there were widespread concerns about the the sort of the inference might imply that she was suggesting that there were concerns about the ability to meet equity needs as opposed to hey we're paying a lot of attention to this. Right. Is do you have a suggested edit or do we think we could find a? What if I said Miss Bodie noted that great attention is paid to concerns about equity. Yes, Ms. Arenas. Um, I actually, although we were we were talking about math um, mm -hmm. and sort of the math department, I actually understood her comments just more general. Mm -hmm. So maybe even striking that that phrase, particularly in the math department, because I had the same reaction as Marriott did when I was reading this and sort of on the fence about it. Okay, is that otherwise the uh, good? I'm yes. sorry. Can you explain the issue again? Uh, there isn't. <clears throat> A lot of so um, not not I think my interpretation of what she said wasn't that she was saying one way or the other whether or not there are concerns or not concerns but she was I think saying that we at the middle school are paying a lot of attention to to equity in general and in particular with which we can strike I don't know with that but to, to the math to the math in the, in the math department as well because I think we we're talking about that in general and she was saying this is something we're really focused on versus the way it reads to me, I think you can interpret it as something different than I think what her intent was with her comment, or at least how I you know, interpreted her comment when she made it. Uh, can we say, would it be, does it sound comfortable to say Ms. Bodie noted that um, Ms. Bodie um, noted that there are concerns around equity in the math department? Not that they're pervasive, but that there are equity concerns. Because the second sentence sort of blends itself into. Yeah, so the way I remembered it wasn't, <clears throat> her comments weren't that it was about concerns, it was about the intentionality of the focus. I, don't, I think she was, I, I, I recall her comments not kind of being neutral about concerns. That wasn't really what she was aiming at, it was that um, I think what she was saying is that they have a consistent approach that includes a focus on the topic, not concerns or no concerns. I, I feel like the concern piece wasn't actually 
I'm making no judgment. I just didn't hear that. Her statements focused on that. It was more about the <coughs> attention that the middle school staff were paying to equity issues. Which is essentially my recollection. So could you read back? What if I changed it to say, um, Ms. Bodie noted that there is a consistent approach in the middle school with a strong focus on equity. Please. Dr. Mars. Yes, yeah. so, could I, maybe, I'm not good at this, you know that, Debbie, but um, that um, middle school staff um, maintain a focus on equity as they, uh, now I'm getting lost in the end of the sentence, I shouldn't raise my hand yet, um, maintain a focus on equity as they approach their work. And that's sort of like, in layman's terms, what I got from a much longer, more detailed statement. It wasn't like a value judgment, it's just right. what I recall. Did you read that back? Um, you would read, Ms. Bodie noted that middle school staff maintain a focus on equity as they approach their work. And then it would go into, she explained that there is a great deal of flexibility to meet with the middle school during the class. Okay, is that, okay? I, mean, I think it, I think that does, you know, please, Ms. Um, I, I'm fine with that change, but could I suggest maybe, um, you know, we, we can make that change and I don't know if the chair wants to move ahead and, and um, approve this with the committee's permission, but maybe also uh, Debbie could go back and just double check to make sure that that's accurate and it's not, you know. Um, I, th I think that sounds good because to be honest with you, my recollection of what she, is that the reason why that statement stood out for me was that I felt she was actually making a fairly strong assertion that equity concerns were being um, attended to in a diligent and energetic fashion by the staff. That's not a quote, by the way. I'm just saying, I think that's, I'm saying it's an effective paraphrase, which, which, which really is distinct. And the reason it struck me is because it was a strong statement or assertion that stood outside of the question of whether there were, in fact, any concerns people had about whether you know, those equity issues were being addressed effectively, you know what I mean? So, anyways. Without objection to that? Okay. Anything else? There's a lot of stuff in here, so I recognize. Give people a second. It's the problem whenever you think you're going to rush, right? Like whenever you think you're going to rush, you're always, it's always going to happen that there's, a lot of text, a lot of stuff to fix. Okay, seeing, I pause for two seconds. I want to say seeing none. Uh, all those in favor of approving the minutes uh, of December 12th and December 20th as amended with the uh, little footnote, but uh, be checking the video. But please raise your hand signifying aye. They are approved unanimously with, uh, again, two um, absences. Yes, come. Just one note um, that could be off base on this, but I think the next time the region gets together, we might want to call a union meeting just to approve the notes of December 20th because the union may not be getting together for a while. Um, so, just as a mental note, you know, more for Debbie. You know. Yeah, yeah I had actually sent a note to Debbie earlier. Oh, today sorry. About that. Wow. No, that's, it's, we're on the same page, wow. so that's good. <laughs> Thanks, Anastasia. Great. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, announcements and public comments. Uh, we're now open for public comments. Uh, you have uh, up to three minutes. Please step forward to the microphone and uh, uh, state your name. And then we're happy to hear from you. My name is Kathleen Anderson. I'm a former school committee member for the town of Amherst. I'm a 15th generation USer. I'm a fourth generation college graduate and a third generation master's degree holder. I'm also a former uh, social justice, anti-racism educator in the district doing professional development work with staff and um, doing work with students. There's a strong need for all of our staff to be focused on uh, social justice issues, particularly as it pertains to whiteness and how it interrupts the social justice intention of educators in the school district. One of the uh, ways that the school can also 
um, pay attention to itself as a social justice school system um, and a multicultural school system is to uh, address ways in which discipline is dealt with across the school system. Um, I'm a former employee of the school district. I have worked in the library here and I have substituted at all of the schools in the district. Um, I have witnessed a number of situations where educators have unjustly targeted uh, brown-skinned students. I'm also currently a member of the subcommittee of the school committee, the School Equity Task Force. And one of the um, ways in which the School Equity Task Force has uh, recommended the district deal with it, its discipline issues is a program called RJ. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was seeking RJ hearing racial justice. Yes, racial justice. Okay. A uh, member of our committee, the School Equity Task Force Committee, is unable to make it here tonight. <coughs> and um, she pr uh, has a statement that she gave to us and I told her I would read it here. So I'm going to do that now. As school committee members, you are elected by the community comprised of parents, mothers, fathers, grandparents, grandfathers, foster parents, step parents, and others to serve our children, all of our children. The program of restorative justice restorative justice, presented and endorsed by the School Equity Task Force, a subcommittee of the Regional School Committee, will do just that. Restorative justice will empower our youth with life skills. The skills to seek conflict resolution will carry our youth into today's world with knowledge and understanding of why there is hatred and resentment towards marginalized people in the first place. By this, I mean it is no secret that the vast majority of people in the United States are oppressed and have been throughout the history of the country. Restorative justice seeks to address this oppression as it plays out in the classroom. Restorative justice will empower our youth with confidence and leadership to address conflict in, the, in a safe environment, to share feelings and experiences that will help our youth blossom into productive members of the greater society. Restorative justice is a lifelong tool that can be used in all areas of life because after all, conflict among humans is as old as humanity and time itself. However, as responsible adults, it is up to us to keep our children safe, especially while our public schools, while in our public schools. Restorative justice is a means to that end. With restorative justice strongly in place, I believe the disproportionate measures of discipline against our youth of color low-income students and students on IEPs will stop, which has existed for far too long and too many years in the Amherst, Pelham, and regional school districts. Our youth will be lifted. Instead of turning, the street, turning to the streets, they will have the skills to overcome the disparities stacked against them and prosper. Isn't that what we want for all of our youth. If you, as holders and distributors of the funds, needed to, this, to keep this program running, deny the money and support being sought, well then, you simply become another entity causing our youth more harm than good. And this was written by Mary Lou Conca. Um, and so I thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, any further public comment? Seeing none, any announcements from the school committee? Mr. Demling. Uh, Dr. Morris, I don't know if you want to give a brief update on the charter school expansion. 
Sure. Why don't you do that during your superintendent update? I will. <laughs> <laughs> He's not exactly a member of the public. <laughs> sure. Any other announcements? Seeing none. Hey, look at oh, super subcommittee updates. You'll have to wait. Uh, I'm just going to, I mean, as you notice, this is now a abbreviated agenda that simply says we want to hear updates from subcommittees. So this is on a volunteeristic basis. If you happen to be on a said subcommittee, you have to jog your memory and raise your hand. Otherwise, we're going to move forward on the agenda. Uh, <laughs> I'm just checking. Are we on the, we are on the agenda. Yeah, so the superintendent evaluation stuff is on the agenda already. Okay. Yes, please. Um, we did attend the budget coordinating group. Yes. Would, would you like to give an update on that as the as the regional rep? I have what he I have the points uh, that he sent us. Would it be helpful to simply share those? Or sure. How would you like to? So we were at a budget coordinating group meeting. <laughs> Uh, and I don't have those points in front of me. I would I would say as an introduction, and this is something which is going to end up being, I think, a challenging. Honestly, the next couple months are going to be really challenging for all of us and challenging for our community um, because, uh, for a variety of reasons, our our budget news isn't very optimistic. It isn't very positive, and um, the meeting we went to at what's called the BCG um, went through. I think in fairly good detail a lot of the reasons why that's the case um, and regardless a lot of it has to do with frankly health care costs um, less less premium increases than um, payouts that are needed to be needed to occur to pay for medical expenses as a as a self-insured um, municipality and our um, employees within the school district are members of that same uh, municipal uh, health care trust fund and so um, there we have handouts we can we can share or next week or something that show uh, the decline in the reserves of that trust fund um, the increase in demands on that trust fund um, and some of the interim solutions that have tried to um, and this is painful because it, the, the solutions that try to stabilize the balances in the fund uh, involve increases in payments um, for, of course, the district and puts pressure on our budgets, but it also includes increases in payments by employees in the district. And so um, it represents a real strain on people who have not um, received significant uh, salary increases over the last few years. I think there's a general recognition that that is um, very, very challenging for everyone involved. But unfortunately, the, uh, the, the, the fund has to balance and the um, promises that have been made, obviously, to people who have um, uh, needs for health care services, also those obligations have to be met. It's both legal, but obviously ethically and morally, they have to be met as well. And so the point being on that is simply that um, regardless of how one does any kind of deep dive to understand how we get there or even where we go, and the, the town manager talked about in the meeting, um, the ways in which the insurance advisory group, I think it's called, is is working, which includes members of unions, uh, so it's it's a broad collaborative effort, are trying to understand different ways of structuring um, healthcare plans on a going forward basis. Um, but unfortunately, that doesn't change the fact that uh, both for this fiscal year as well as also for the next fiscal year, there's going to be a challenge to balance, um, and that's going to um, affect really everything we're doing. It's also going to affect, frankly, conversations in which when we talk about the regional assessment um, for the different towns and the formula we use, that's not supposed to be a subject of, of budgeting and needs. It's supposed to be you have the formula, you apply the formula, whatever the budget is, the towns pay what they're supposed to pay. Anyone who's been following this discussion recognizes that that really isn't how it's been working. There's been sort of a back and forth about both uh, the propriety or rationale or equity of the assessments, but also then um, how we're doing budgeting and so that's going to get even more complicated um, the the vote already happened at the finance committee and I think it's been publicized so the the um, I guess you call it good news I mean it is certainly good news for the school budget is the we had had a, a two and a half percent guidance for an increase in budget um, from 
uh, the Finance Committee and from the town um, that we were governed by. And due to this pressure, um, the Finance Committee and the town manager and select board have, are recommending a 3.5% increase. Um, that represents a 3.1% increase, I think, for the Amherst School District. Um, not to get into that, but I'm just saying it's following the way that normally works. Um, so that eases the pressure a little bit, but not completely. I don't want to go further on, I mean, other than whatever comments you guys want to make, I don't want to go further on this, as well as, as Marriott was there too, um, only because we have a next meeting is solely devoted to this topic. Um, and so I don't want to spend more too much time knowing that we're going to dive deeply and also that a lot of the information that the committee and the public should have before them to allow them to dive into that. You know, it's not fair to have a conversation which is an asymmetry of information. But having said that, I'll kick it this way and then any other way anyone wants. I'm just looking at the points that were made, and I, I, I think um, I think it was Mr. Steinberg added that point, which I think is worth mentioning, just um, in terms of you know the potential of using reserves to cover the gap in expenses, and that you know while there are some, you know we've done a good job with you know having a having reserves uh, available that to to use them for ongoing operating expenses is not a wise um, strategy. So you know, I, I think that maybe we could send these out to everybody yeah. and that might be something to do before That would be great. Do you, do, you, do you have that for Deb to send out? Yeah. Great. Take care. Anything else on this? Guarantee you, next week we're going to have a lot of fun on this topic. <laughs> uh, 23rd. A lot of, lot of conversation. Um, any other committees? Seeing none. Uh, Superintendent. Sure. So um, first, I just want to say there's no school tomorrow. School's canceled because of the storm. So kids are already rejoicing from what I understand, not included. <laughs> um, so that's the first thing. Um, to Mr. Demling's question, uh, last Friday, the uh, acting commissioner, I would happen to be in the same space as him, so I got a little bit of a heads up early, which was neat. Um, but he is not recommending that the expansion request from PBCICS um, go to the board. Um, so you all were involved in some advocacy around that issue and, and writing letters. And, um, and so there is an appeal process pros possible, but it wouldn't be anytime soon. It wouldn't be anything. The next board meeting uh, is January, it's actually next Tuesday. Um, and it was clarified to me that even if they do appeal, um, it would be a, we would get notified and it wouldn't be kind of the day before kind of thing. Also, the commissioner relayed, and both this was in the press reporting as well, that there, he's recommending that they, the school wait two to three years to resolve the concerns of the board before they reapply. Um, so I won't make any judgment on that. That's been, you know, publicly reported. So that's where that stands. Are there any, um, other, any other questions on yeah, that? Yeah, please. I just figured we'd pause on that because yeah, that's obviously you. a big issue. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip around a little bit. Um, name of time. I'll just mention the logo thing because I'm getting a lot of feedback on that, uh, positive feedback for the process. That was an iterative one, and more than 700 people already responded to the poll today. By noon of today, it's closes Friday, Friday afternoon, and the newsletter will let, announce the new logo, which is majority mm -hmm. vote. Um, but um, a lot of the comments were just kind of appreciating that there were multiple options, multiple feedback, different options presented. Um, so that's gone well. Uh, the Martin Luther King holiday event um, was this weekend on Saturday, three seniors, I mentioned this in particular, uh, related to someone who's in the room, Aviva Weinbaum, Sahar Douglas, Kiara Hardnett Barnes were honored um, as the scholarship Martin Luther, Dr. Martin Luther King scholarship winners, and our own high school teacher Tracy Vernon was awarded with the Citizens Award for 16 years of dedication to students. I know this is a regional meeting, but uh, I believe it's the first time or first time in a while that uh, we had an elementary group also present and perform there. So. Um, just as, uh, I'm going to skip these, except uh, ones that time sensitive. <coughs> uh, well, I'll, I'll mention the Shootsbury one because Steve, Mr. Sullivan's not here, but he attended and actually kind of was the lead introducer. We had a, a, a great event which we talked about in this room at Shootsbury Elementary last week. We were supposed to be at um, Leverett tomorrow night, but that's not going to happen because of the we weather. About 12 people come, which for the size of the school, people felt good about. And I think the, the larger piece, so it's um, Patty Bodie, Mark Jackson, myself, uh, it's 10, 15 minutes of presentation or and then an hour and a half of discussion about the middle school, high school. And the thing that was the most notable 
was the number of times someone said, we're really happy that you came up here. We didn't think that people from Amherst would come. It was always the other way around. And so I think that messaging was really important, that that's what they're coming back and reporting back. There was also a piece of a number of people couldn't come tonight, and they really appreciated this was the talk of the school that kind of like the people from Amherst to go up the hill instead of them having to come down the hill. Um, so uh, as a side note, we enjoyed ourselves. Mr. Sullivan bakes really good brownies. So <laughs> <laughs> they're good enough where it's worth mentioning. They're not store-bought. He reminded a couple times uh, the group of that. Um, so um, I think the only other thing I'll mention, uh, and then Ms. Ms. Cunningham's going to do an introduction, um, the Fort Towns meeting that's a typo, it is Saturday, January 27th. My apologies oh. for that. Um, just as a reminder, I know Ms. Westmoreland set it out, but I want to say at a public meeting, and we'll be talking an awful lot about this next Tuesday, um, but it is Saturday, um, January 27th, 9 to 11, in the middle school library, and um, we'll, again, that'll be a, a major topic, not just the content, but also the process pieces we'll be talked about next Tuesday night. Mm -hmm. Ms. Cunningham has an introduction to make. Okay. All right, so I believe I mentioned before that we went through this vast screening process to find our facilities director. So it was a combination of having the town employees who he would be supervising as well as school district employees come together and just um, meet with our potential candidates. And th these candidates went through about four rounds of interviews. So they had the screening, then they had the actual interview, and then they met with other people. And then finally they culminated it with a meeting with Mike and Paul Bachman. Um, so needless to say, we have chosen Jim McPherson as our new facilities director. He started on January 3rd and hit the ground running because January 4th was a snow day. <laughs> <laughs> and he is here with us today, so I'd like to welcome him to our school district. And um, maybe you can come and say a few words, Jim. federal government, 30 years experience uh, designing and overseeing construction projects, uh, have been working locally as well, and I'm looking forward to working with the school. Questions? <laughs> there, there always are. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. We, we, you know, um, boilers break, roofs need to be fixed. <laughs> uh, this is, uh, I don't know, water bubblers need to be like completely overhauled. So I can um, simplify we, your life. This, no, this is, I'm just saying this is, at a very practical level, one of the most popular positions, I think, in the entire school district. Again, I'm not sure popular is the part of that, <laughs> but just send money, we'll be okay. Good. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's been an oh, <laughs> and I'm hoping 30 years of experience are going to help you spend that money efficiently. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anything else? Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, so um, one, actually, speaking of brownies and going up the hill, um, I just want to make note of the fact that um, uh, we have our we have our Leverett and our Shutesbury committee members who are not able to attend tonight. And that was a subject of some discussion earlier with uh, Dr. Morris and myself because um, I'm, I'm not super comfortable uh, with the fact that they aren't represented. And I mean, you weren't either, by the way. I'm not suggesting it was like a <laughs> <laughs> conversation. That was the nature of the dialogue: is that we, we, we you know, we needed to meet. Um, frankly, earlier in the day, when the weather looked like it might be a little lighter this evening, the only reason we went ahead was a the sound of we've got. The, we were told the letter would be a little lighter, and B, that would have meant that Mr. Sullivan had been able to be here, because we knew Ms. Kosensky couldn't be here anyways. And so um, I'm just saying that out loud, because, you know, anyone watching or anyone picking up on this stuff, you know, we're trying to make an effort to make sure we're all working together and we're all listening and hearing from one another, and you've got to be present to be able to do that. Yes? I also want to acknowledge um, uh, the Amherst Media for also making the effort and the trek to be here with them. Absolutely. Absolutely. They are, they are uh, superheroes and superheroines. Um, and just an, as another note, by the way, I, I, uh, I got uh, buzzed the other day from the uh, Mass Association of School Committees that there's some interest in uh, pumping additional life into their regional schools committee. Uh, and of the, of the, the association um, and to make sure that over the next year or so 
that 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 work is very visible and so uh, stay tuned because it was really just her outreach um, as for me as chair around um, what level of interest I guess we have in the topics and wanting to engage but I thought that was very promising and very good uh, other than that everything before you is what we're doing right so yes Can I add to that last sure yes. um, so when I was with the acting commissioner one of the topics that was raised by one of my colleagues um, this was with Western Mass superintendents was exactly that about regional schools and the state auditor's <coughs> report which was forwarded to you by state auditor um, bump uh, on regional schools um, he's only gonna be the commissioner a little while longer finalists were mentioned were announced today yeah. uh, for that post but he was he said he was highly empathetic highly supportive of the state auditor's recommendation and highly limited because it's more in the legislature's hand than it is in the department's mm -hmm. hand so uh, he kind of all did all but encourage us to encourage kind of local uh, elected officials to get involved uh, because he seemed very amenable to working with the legislature and with yes. superintendents and school committees on the topic but right now where the changes that were recommended would make is, is mostly not in Desi's bailiwick it's much more in the state legislature which is interesting because that was the nature of the engagement yeah that um, we need to essentially that we need to get organized and we need to engage the legislature Mr. yeah so to that so we had a tabled item for uh, from the previous meeting advocacy for the state auditor's report on regional school mm -hmm. financing mm -hmm. I don't know if we're circling back to that soon or whether this is the time to talk about that or no we will I mean we will it's just the, the reality I mean there are a couple items that we would have we need to move on our agenda too. There are a number. There are a few things that we wanted to talk about that we thought, in the interest of not having meetings that go to eleven, that it was going to be. We had to cut different places. Yeah. And I don't want to give the laundry list. But <coughs> I think there are members of the committee sitting around the table. All of them. I could apologize to individually uh, that their items aren't on here. Um, and I'll do that sometime if you really want me to. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we'll, we, we will definitely circle back. Is the point? Uh, so, with that. Uh, who would like to introduce the CPAC presentation? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So um, I just want to, you've heard me say this before, but uh, I want to say it again, um, how grateful and appreciative that we are in Amherst and collectively, I'm not talking about the we around the table, I mean we, including students, families, and staff, to have um, highly active and engaged CPAC. And so this is a presentation that was planned, I think, for uh, late October, early November. I might be mixing it up, but I know that we had a scheduling snafu. and. Uh, thankfully, the snow held out long enough for um, the three of you to be here. So I want to introduce Dr. Fred Brady, who have met before as a student service director. Um, Dr. Renee Greenfield, who works in that office. And our CPAC president, Nancy Stewart. So um, and I think collectively, it's um, I think this is a model of how they operate. Um, all three are work together collaboratively. It's not that there's always agreement, but it's always a commitment to work together collaboratively to improve our district. So thank you all for being here in this snowy Can evening. And putting do we have a visual for the Yeah, I'm going to. Yep, I will. <coughs> Can I provide a disclosure? Um, Nancy's the, my, my son's uh, basketball coach. <laughs> 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 He's a very good player, too. <laughs> That was new information for me, so. It's really my husband and coaches. I, I'm just there for moral support, right? No, you're, yeah. you're the coach. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Advancing the songs. She has, oh, it's right here. Oh, here. Right. So um, thank you for having us join even on a snowy night, and we'll keep time. Um, in mind as we do this but we're going to try to focus just a little bit on a presentation and really give you an opportunity to engage with us about any thoughts any comments any questions and really have a discussion more than a presentation if that's okay so um, and I do want to apologize in advance in your packet the um, papers you got the nice pretty color ones that are there um, we added some slides to that so the black and white one that I put at your tables tonight have the new slides included so um, you can go back and forth but there's just a few slides left at the end so um, tonight our, our plan was to be sharing with you the results of a survey that we did last spring in May 
um, which was a repeat of a survey that was done back in 2010 um, before I was here. Actually, when I was hired um, in 2012, I was given the report from the public consulting group and said, this is really important for you to read and to dig into as information to guide um, your work. So um, to kind of take a dipstick and see where we were um, seven years after that, we didn't engage in the full program evaluation, but we chose to use that same survey um, seven years later so that we could have some comparisons. People have changed, personnel have changed, students have changed. Well, the, some students are still here. They've just gotten older. And some families have changed, but some are the same. But in order to really be able to compare a little bit, even though some of the variables have changed. So this survey um, we wanted to share with you. We've shared the full report with you as well as the executive summary. And I might want to tell just kind of the people out there who might be watching either tonight or at some other time that these reports are also on our website. So if you look under student services, there's a link to the 2010 report as well as the 2017 report. Um, but in addition to going over that survey tonight, we and some of the points of that survey, we're not going to go through the whole thing tonight. Um, we also had a request from school committee, I don't know if it was collectively or if an individual, to give an update on co-teaching. Um, and I think that that really ties in well to the survey. Um, in the survey, there was a fair amount of responses about co-teaching. So they make sense to talk about together. Um, so mostly Nancy and Renee are going to talk in a little while and give you this. Um, but I do want to say the reason, and Joanne Smith, who's our administrator in the Student Services Department, she was not able to join tonight. Otherwise, she would be sharing some of the survey results. Um, but I think it's important that Nancy Stewart, who is our CPAC president, um, present this because it was on Nancy and CPAC's recommendation that it was time to do an updated survey. Um, so it would, in our work, um, as Mike referenced, we have a really good partnership, well, at least that's what I would say, and we work really closely together. And Nancy is also really good, as well as all of our CPAC um, participants, to ask us questions and to ask us really ref to reflect and look at our practices and look at what we're doing so that we keep the positive outcomes for students as our goal. So Nancy's going to do most of that tonight. So um, this is just a, a cover slide, which is a little bit what I've already covered. I just want to share with you one thing that's, I think, important to note. Um, the, in terms of the responses where you see 203 parent guardian responses this time, that is a reduction in the percent of responses from 2010. 2010, our parent response rate was about 58%, and this reflects about a 39% mm -hmm. um, decrease. I've asked public consulting group to please explain why that might be. There's no way for them to really know what that might be um, in reference to. We sent out reminders many, many times. Teachers sent out reminders. So it wasn't for a lack of kind of um, asking people for responses. But they still said 39% is a, when you're talking about surveys, is a reasonable response rate to be able to take the data that you get from that and make some assumptions or projections based upon that. Um, the flip side, the 370 um, response rates um, was significantly higher. We, in 2010, had a 52% response from personnel and a 64% response um, this time in the last spring. And we did include paraeducators this time, which was an explicit decision. Um, we thought their responses and their views on how we're doing was important to include, and that wasn't back in 2010. So again, I'm not sure why the increase or why the decrease, but I thought it was important to note for you. Um, so we're going to go right to our responses, which you're going to see that they're in categories. If you're interested in more specifics, feel free to read the whole report. Or when we get to questions, you can ask us questions. So Nancy is going to share all about our responses here. OK, great. Thanks for having me here again tonight. I appreciate it. Um, I want to first um, say to you that 
we have a ton of good news to share with you as far as this survey goes. You'll see dramatic improvements, but I just want to share for that family that is um, out there and not feeling the way that the survey says that many other parents feel, I want that family to know that they have me as a resource, they have you as a resource, they have Dr. Brady as a resource, there, there are many, they have the building principals as a resource, they have their school liaison as a resource, because we're truly not, you know, we truly want to make everybody feel good about the education that they're getting here in Amherst. Like, that's the goal. That's the goal. Um, but you'll see, if you were to comb through this survey, that there is improvement in every single area since 2010. <coughs> um, you'll see that the rates for parents went up by 90%, which is huge. You know, back in 2010, we weren't feeling so great about having our kids in school when they needed specialized instruction. It's changed over time. Is it perfect? No. But it's heading so much in the right direction. And that has a lot to do with the leadership that we have in our school, the leadership that we have in our buildings, the teachers. The teachers work so very hard. You know, the one thing I wish that I could give our teachers a find is extra time. And you'll hear that as we go through and look at the, some of these survey results. You know, parents today, they really feel like they have an opportunity to participate during the IEP meeting. Um, most of the teachers, the, most of the parents feel as though their general education teacher is very involved. At every IEP meeting, the general education teacher is at that meeting. So that's something that happens on a regular basis. They also feel as though that the future looks brighter than it did beforehand. There's a 30% increase that people feel like my child is going to be headed for a brighter future. That's, that's important. I will tell you that as a parent of five children, back in 2010, I had um, a son on an IEP. I still have a son, on, it's the same son, I still have a son on, um, on an IEP as well too. So I mean, I think that I represent lots of different hats, but I just want you to know I was here in 2010. Um, so I can, I can appreciate the fact and see the growth that is happening in many of the schools. Um, progress, you know, progress gets updated every single time a progress report gets, goes home and you can see those are being more measured in an accurate way to show that students are making progress. You know, the way that goals are set and benchmarked are so much better today than they were back in 2010. Um, an area, one of the areas that we have to work on is transition services. And when we think about transition, some people just think about transition from high school on out. But transition truly happens all the time. It happens when you have a child in preschool go to kindergarten. It happens even from, from a parent's point of view when you go from kindergarten to first grade, then first grade to second grade, unless you get lucky and have somebody who loops. But there's transitions that happen all the time. And they happen very differently um, from school to school. And, and that's an area that we have um, to do some work on. We can talk about that some more later. You can just flip, if you don't mind being the official flipper. Miss <laughs> Flipper. Um, parent, guardian, responses. Just as a synopsis of the strengths, we talked about a highly skilled staff. I will say that um, from my perspective, that we've spent more time trying to train our staff um, and making sure that people understand what is, you know, different things that we can do, different skill sets that we can provide to teachers to help um, our students learn in different ways. Um, again, the time is an issue, but you know, we're really, um, when you think about the amount of time that you devote for training, it, it's not as robust as I'd like to see it personally, I will say, um, but we do the best that we can with the time that we have. Um, and again, that's a budget thing, um, training time. We have strong support for inclusion, and when you think about inclusion, we're, you know, we're talking about you know, having a student in the classroom with their peers, learning with their peers, not just in the classroom, but actually in the classroom and learning. And I will say that I think co-teaching has really helped with that. You know, it's really opened minds, it's opened doors 
you know, those mines and doors aren't just open for the 20% of our population, roughly, on an IEP, but also for the students who aren't on an, I, uh, on an IEP. You'll see, um, if you were to look, th again, through the data more thoroughly, that staff serves as advocates. Parents feel as though that, you know, our staff has our kids back and is going to help us through this process. And especially here in the high school, um, they do a lot to teach students how to advocate for themselves. And that's something that if you were to go back and compare seven years worth of, you know, 2010 to now, you'll see that the high school is doing a tremendously good job and supporting our kids and helping them advocate for themselves. And our um, parent communication is a lot better than it has been in the past as well, too. So this is a tough one, right, because um, areas for improvement, not that that part of it isn't hard, the areas for improvement, but trying to make them more terminology friendly, though, uh, wow, you know, you could have a cheat sheet right there, like, for parents, because there's just so many things, like some of the testing and all the different things that are being done. It, it, it can be a lot for a parent if you've never sat in on an IEP meeting. It's a lot. It can feel really overwhelming. You know, parents wish they were sort of like a cheat sheet. Unfortunately, you know, there are, there are pockets of them per se, but there's really nothing that has everything there for people to understand. It's, it's hard. Um, another area for improvement is more gen ed teacher involvement and co-teaching opportunities. Again, that's talking about um, some collaboration, and Renee will talk about that um, a little bit more. And some people would like to see more communication outside of team meetings. And for the families that I work with and that the families that I support, I found it to be that it's knowing who to call. It's not that the staff isn't willing to go ahead and communicate with the person. It's just that sometimes families get stuck. You know, they're, they're not sure who it is that they need to call. Who is their next go-to person? So um, that's an area that we have for improvement. Staff responses. This, this feels good, the staff responses. You know, these are the people that work with our kids day in, day out. They, um, almost all people agree that students are kept as according to law in the least restrictive environment. Um, and that as far as a process goes, we, there's a pre-referral process that happens when a student is being deemed to see whether or not they belong on an IEP or not. And I feel as though that's an area that we need to take a look at. And I think um, if you have some questions, Dr. Brady can talk to you some more about that. As far as communication and support go, you know, back in 2010, I will share with you, Dr. Brady was not here. Um, and, you know, the staff was doing the best that they could with everybody that they had, but I think having Dr. Brady as part of our staff has helped immensely. The, I don't think there's no, it's obvious that she's helped immensely. She works really hard at trying to make sure that we all communicate with each other. Um, and I think that that's why you see on there for communication and support that there is such an improvement between general education and special education. Because they really go hand in hand. We're talking about 20% of our population. How can it not go hand in hand? Um, not to beat a dead horse, but the collaborative planning time is not sufficient. It's a huge issue. This is an issue. I, I don't know the solution to it, um, but I will let you know that training and having time to collaborate is an issue. It's not that people don't want to do it. It's not that we don't have tools identified to do it. You know, we need to be organized about how we go about making sure we're providing this for our teachers. And we've had very, very positive uh, responses from teachers about co-teaching in general. And um, as reflected back in 2010, um, the staff feels positive about its interactions that it has with families. And I will tell you that it's not always easy. You know, it's not always easy. Um, so strengths, um, we're talking about collaboration again um, to, between special education and general education, co-teaching, inclusion, 
and the staff recognizes that the team that they work with you know are really caring you know it's not just about collecting a paycheck it's about you know really trying to educate a student creating access and letting them follow their dream um, areas for uh, improvement were the pre-referral practices that we have we've been working on our paraeducator training um, and I'm so glad that um, Dr. Brady made the decision to include their feedback because it's critical. They work with our kids so, so closely. Um, but we do have room for improvement in paraeducator training. Um, and support for co-teaching, meaning talking about planning time. And, you know, co-teaching really, honestly, in my opinion, has really opened the door for so many kids. I'm not talking about just kids on an IEP. As I said, I have five kids, and I have a child um, at the middle school and in one of his classroom, he's a co-taught, he's in a co-taught classroom. He'll tell me, I got help from so-and-so. And I was like, oh, wow, that's great. That's the special ed co-teacher. He has no idea that that's a special ed co-teacher, but he'll share like how she helped with like a writing piece or some other sort of piece. So, and I think, um, Renee will talk about some of that um, as we move ahead with this. I think. Um, let me just introduce, because you may not all know, um, Dr. Greenfield, who is our, this is a new title, because um, we didn't have this position before. I'll let you do your own clicking. Um, a specialized instructional coach. And one of Renee's responsibilities um, is coaching um, the co-teachers, training and co-teaching them including there's many other um, ones but tonight she's going to really focus on the co-teaching work so awesome nice to meet you collectively <laughs> um so i'm going to give you three things uh, like a quick update because i'm not sure how much people know about co-teaching so i figured i'd start at the basics and then um share some ongoing data we've been collecting i've been here since 2015 so some ongoing data and then some hot off the presses data just collected right before the holiday break um, and then happy to answer any questions um, so where is co-teaching happening it's happening everywhere in every building um, we have um, about 25 elementary pairs or teams or triads there's different iterations in different buildings depending on what kids need and then we have about 13 pairs um, between the middle and the high school co-teaching came out of the work um, originally for teachers who um, special education teachers and gen ed teachers. And what we found in the district is that many of our English language, uh, many of our ESL teachers um, were doing a lot of inclusion work and wanted to um, engage in more, in more co-teaching. And the same is true for just a few speech and language pathologists. So what started as a gen ed special education um, co-teaching model has morphed in this past year to include some ESL teachers and some speech and language pathologists at the elementary level. So people ask me like, so what's co-teaching look like? And the answer is it depends on what kind of classroom you're in and what age group you're teaching. Here at the high school, um, I have five different pairs that I work with. Um, so Krista Larson and Raloon um, co-teach a, um, a bio course in 10th grade. Um, and they do that one period a day and then you may go to an elementary class um, and spend time with a first grade pair at Fort River and they spend the majority of the day together. So it could, it's sort of defined as one period or one hour and it could last um, to multiple hours um, for most of the day. Part of what we know about the research about co-teaching is that in order for co-teaching to really work, teachers need two things. They need non-evaluative coaching and they need professional development. So as Faye said before, part of my job is to do both of those things. And one of the things um, that people have, co-teachers have had ongoing professional development. This year we've uh, generated a co-teaching institute that met in August. Um, we just met in the winter and the spring. Teachers are invited to come and participate. Um, what we know now three years in is that um, teachers are spending lots more time sharing with one another about effective practices. Um, and the time thing that we know about. Um, so here's what we are gleaning at this point um, around what the benefits 
um, that we're seeing in Amherst. Um, data that comes from students. When I go in to um, visit classrooms, I talk to kids because they're there all the time. And oftentimes, people don't talk to kids. And they know lots. And so what, we, what I find is that kids report two really strong things. When I say, how's it going? Um, they often report, I get help so much faster. So I call that the efficiency model, right? Well, there's two of them. So I get what I need faster. Okay, that's good. And then the second uh, most common sort of uh, description is that if I can't figure it out, you know, the way Miss Cunningham's teaching it, then when Dr. Morris explains it, then I have two chances of understanding because they explain it in two different ways. So that specialized sort of way around instruction. Um, we know that kids are experiencing um, station-based teaching in all levels um, and that they're having access to skilled educators. So that we know. Some of the challenges is balancing the demands of teaching discrete skills in the context of a gen ed class. As you know, a few of our buildings are louder than others. Um, so the noise factor and the attention factor certainly comes into play. And teachers are working on ways to fix that. Um, am I going too fast? OK. OK, so here's some data. Um, so in 2015, we, um, in the spring of 2015, some teachers had been co-teaching, um, but in a formal way, we, um, Mike and Faye launched sort of co-teaching off, uh, and we surveyed teachers before they began. And so some of the data you're going to see tonight is about what they perceived was going to happen, and then you'll see data in 2016 and 2017 about what's actually their lived experience. And I just selected, um, and I'm happy to share any of this data with folks, but I just selected some key questions that had interest, what I would call interesting things. Um, this teacher perception data, you may be wondering, like, why are we asking teachers what they think? Um, and one of the reasons why is because what we know is that oftentimes what teachers um, perceive and believe is what they enact. And so based on their perceptions, we can make some inferences about how we think they may um, how that may influence their practice. So I have a couple questions I want to show you, and I do want to show you the number of teachers we're talking about. And again, some pairs have changed, but um, in 2015, we just had um, gen ed teachers and special educators, and same with 2016, and it's just this year that we've included six ELL teachers and two um, SLPs. Um, these are surveys that teachers are encouraged to complete, but they're not required to complete, so... Um, this year we had a completion rate of 46. Um, so let me show you the questions because I think the pictures are pretty, actually. So I'm not like a neutral person. So when we survey people, we ask you to strongly agree, agree, or disagree, or strongly disagree. So we're asking teachers to make a stance because to me, neutral feels a little neutral. <laughs> um, so we want people to sort of make a make a statement about what they believe. So what you'll see is the, um, the light blue line here is in 2015. So remember, that was before they actually engaged in the practice with their partner. 2016 was um, after they had, in the spring of 2016, when they were finishing their first year. And then um, the yellow is just what was reported um, in December of 2017. Um, so again, question eight says, you know, do you work well together? So more than 93% of teachers either reported strongly agree or agreeing in that. So um, this is anonymous, so they hopefully felt safe enough to answer. So we have a 93% um, strongly agree or agree. 82%, um, you know, so you see a little dip there about like what they maybe thought and what's the reality Enhan that co-teaching enhances their practice. Um, we spent a lot of time last year because the data, we used the data to drive the professional development. So the data came out that 45, you know, less than half of you feel like there's equitable roles between special educators and, and gen ed teachers. Why is that? How do we unpack that? We had some really difficult conversations that I helped to facilitate around, around that, that topic. What is equitable? Oh, that's a great question. Thanks for asking me that. So if you look at a job description, thank God Dorian's here. If you look at a job description for uh, an elementary teacher versus a special education elementary teacher, they have different kinds of roles that they have to do. 
um, and different responsibilities. So an example would be a special educator has to write the IEP and maybe a general education teacher has to complete the classroom report cards. And so when you're co-teaching together, all the responsibilities sort of come together. Um, and so that is a response to whether or not the teachers feel like the roles that one another has feels equal or equitable. Is that good? Fair work balance. Yeah, that would be a, a great way to restate that. Yes. Um, okay, and then question 14 is this question around mutual planning time. The question's phrased, how much do you value mutual planning time? Not are you getting it, are you not, but how much do you value it? Um, so no one disagreed, and we're up almost 98%. Um, said they strongly agreed, agreed. Any questions on these slides, this slide? Yes, Phoebe. It's just an interesting that it we <coughs> jumped from 53% to 97% in terms of why people actually, I mean, do you have a sense of why people, or uh, maybe, maybe that's coming from well, I could answer it now, or we could just keep people on the edge of their seat. <laughs> so one of my thinkings, I mean, these are just thinkings, is that, you know, at the time it was like, well, I think I need that time, perceiving that. And then they actually started doing the work, and then their lived experience was, it was pretty clear that without this mutual planning time, the work that we want to do can't, can't really be done. So that's one of my theories. Um, Okay, so this is a question, so that's over the last three years, and then the next two slides, they, this is what has, has just come back. Because now we're wondering, okay, so what? Now you've had two, some people one, two, three years co-teaching, and many of you have taught alone before, so compare the two experiences for us. And over 97% of teachers reported they strongly agree or agree that co-teaching compared to teaching alone allows for better access to the curriculum. And over 90%, right around 90% of teachers um, agree that it um, provides increased time on task or active learning. And so that sort of corroborates what the students say about, like, I have a question and um, they can get to me faster. Um, so there's a lot of variables at play. Certainly this is one piece of data from a group of teachers, um, but I just think it's interesting. And then we um, asked a series of questions around academic benefits and social emotional benefits for co-teaching, because um, people are wondering. Um, and we asked teachers, what do you think, you know, if in, in being in a co-taught classroom, how does it serve particular learning profiles? So if we look at kids with disabilities, if we look at bilingual learners, and then we look at kids who aren't bilingual and don't have a identified disability? How does co-teaching serve them? And this I find really interesting, really, really interesting. Why do you find it interesting, Mike? I would, would you like yes, to please, yeah. chime in. So one would, uh, and I've done co-teaching, so I find it somewhat surprising, but not incredibly, that the, the reporting is that for students without identified additional support services, I'm linking, I'm loop, you know, linking uh -huh. disabilities or language needs, the benefits are slightly higher than the students with disabilities or bilingual ELL learners. Right. So I just find it interesting. Also with these questions came space for teachers to provide comments. You know, this is just quantitative survey data, but I find it really interesting that, um, that there are both academic and social emotional benefits that teachers can identify in their students um, across all profiles and in particular for kids without any identified needs for whom the model is really crafted for end up you know I just find it really interesting okay so here's like you don't have to read this but these are my takeaways sort of what Phoebe was asking before like so what um, so some suggestions you know that they're um, I'm at the second bullet that you know teachers predictions around practice may have been higher than than their lived experience or, or vice versa um, we say we see trend data over time around that equitable balance if we provide professional development and coaching for teachers could that be one of the factors that allowed them to f find a more equitable place to do their work um, and this and this bit about time, and I would say qualitatively, I meet with many teachers every week, and it is something that is a strong, um, something that they talk to me about all the time. Um, so um, this issue around planning time, um, 
suggest that if it's offered and teachers experience it, there's a high value for them. And then this is the narrative around compared to teaching alone, how teachers um, report out. Um, and the, the data can indicate that teachers perceive that co-teaching can provide both academic and social emotional benefits for all learner, irrespective of their um, learning profile. So I went really fast, because I'm trying to read the room. Um, and, the, and the snow <laughs> that I can't see. Um, but wondered if I should flip back or if people had particular questions. Um, so thank you for this, this is excellent. This, for me, this is the perfect level of deep dive on this. Okay, so great. Excellent balance. Great. Um, I, I find it really interesting, the, the benefit to students not, how did Dr. Marks describe it, students mm -hmm. not with an identified need, um, the there benefit there, because I think there's a perception that co-teaching is for special ed kids, and right. so we invest all this extra money and time for the special ed population, and you know, that's certainly part of it, but you know, for all the other kids' benefit as well, I think is, is pretty revealing. Um, so I, I guess the general question I have, I don't know if this is for you or Dr. Grady or Dr. Uh, Dr. Morris, um, you know, I, I tend to look at these big initiatives in terms of like cost-benefit analysis, and most of this is on the benefit side, so I'm thinking about the cost. And so very simply, I think to myself, okay, double the number of teachers in every classroom, you're going to see these bars go <laughs> up, right? That doesn't come without a cost. And so, you know, without getting too deep in the weeds, you know, what, what are, what's the general alternative to this model? Um, uh, and, um, and and does this is this model much more costly than, than the alternative? So maybe I can start and then um, so a couple things that I think are worth stating is that the model works. Uh, so, so let me take a step back. So it replaces a model where there was what was more prevalent was pull out um, classes for students. I'm going to focus on special needs, although I know ELL students are included. And so um, kind of over time, the district kind of shifted from having more paraeducators involved to having more licensed teachers doing that. And there's, so there, there was some trade-off in cost, but, but there was a financial, there are financial implications. I think the other thing to note is that co-teaching, and I actually think that explains some of the chart that you were talking about with the differences. Um, no one here is stating that co-teaching or an inclusive environment is the right environment for every single student, right? So. One of the things about how you scale it is it has to be based on the student needs, and students' needs evolve and change both individually over time and then collectively in terms of what a grade level or cohort of students need. And so I think, uh, as our good friends in special education know, that you know the needs are going to change, and we have to be agile in changing with them. So I think that's the, when we think about scaling, it may not be that this is the best thing for every student's special needs. And I think that, to me, that's, I wonder if that explains some of the data. Um, but I also see those numbers as really high and, and some of the differences not being super statistically significant given the end size. I'll turn to Dr. Brady go a little deeper. I just want to um, say one thing, or maybe a couple things actually about that. So um, I think there are um, some reports from um, people that they're concerned sometimes if they're student that doesn't have a special need, doesn't have a known disability or some other learning challenge, that if they're in a classroom with students with disabilities, that not only will their child not um, maybe get all their needs met, but actually that that might slow down the pace of the instruction. So I think this data is interesting that way. And I, it's been supported by a number of different studies that say that actually all students um, can benefit from what we know in special education. So I think, but that doesn't mean you have to have two educators in every classroom. Probably more so at the secondary level because that's where you will see a general education teacher maybe teaching one period a day or two periods a day with a special educator and the rest of their schedule they're going to be teaching that same subject maybe but alone and, and Renee can probably speak more to this but what we hear from those teachers is what they are learning and their own development in their instructional practices are shifting so that they're taking what they're learning from working side by side with a special educator and applying that to their other classrooms. So in that way, it's not like you have to put two 
educators with different um, professional backgrounds in the same class for it to benefit many. And you'll see that even at the elementary school where teams of teachers, not everybody has a partner, but when teams of teachers get together, what they learn about in terms of instructional practices or assessment practices, that that can influence all classrooms. So it's not always that you have to have two. You need to have two when there are students in the classroom that have IEPs that a team of people have identified that for them to access that curriculum, that's what is needed for them to make progress. So does that really kind of just like, I wouldn't say like go out and if money was unlimited, let's put two educators in every classroom. I don't think that that's what would be needed. I don't know that everyone would agree with me on that, but I, I, I think there's probably better ways to spend the, that money. Um, so. this, this question reveals how little I know about high school teaching. Uh -huh. Are you saying there's a subject matter teacher and then a special education teacher? Mm -hmm. um, so but what I will say, though, and then I'm going to let Renee answer this, so there's a general education subject matter teacher, and in our high school, we are really fortunate that our special education teachers who are partnered with that general education teacher are also certified or high, highly qualified in that subject. So they're not in chemistry having no clue what to do. They're in there and we've been really explicitly um, in our hiring practices making sure our special education teachers in the secondary level also have a content area specialty. Did you want to jump That's in? That's exactly what I was going to Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I'm sure this is something that you know varies depending on the makeup of every cohort. But in terms of composing classes and considering you know, what the population of is in within a class that has the, the, the mm -hmm. teaching class, I assume there's going to be a grade where you might have two classes that are not full time, one that is. Uh -huh. and, you know, okay, and this, of course, does reference the concern that would the, the initial concern I would expect of, of, of parents of, you know, so-called typical mm -hmm. learners or whatever, you know, how, what does that mean if my child is in a class where there's a higher number of children, right. you know, with, with special needs or with ELL needs? Um, just, just maybe you could talk about yeah. that a little bit. Class composition <laughs> is vitally important, whether you're talking <laughs> about co-teaching or, or whatever. The place where we have less information in terms of putting classes together is in kindergarten. Sometimes we know some of those children, but most of the time it's like, well, let's hope this goes together well. Um, but you don't have a whole lot to go on. But when you're putting together your classes, you really have to think about a real heterogeneous mix. You don't want to put all your students with needs in one classroom. Uh, it, it, that's not going to be good for the students. It's not going to be good for the teachers. It's not good for anyone. And I might say that not every student that has an IEP needs to be in a classroom in every subject area with a special education teacher. So there can be a tendency when you see, oh, this this great pair working together, let's take, you know, all these kids that we say would benefit, let's put them all in that class. Um, it's really incumbent upon the building when they're doing their classes and putting that together to shy away from that and not do that. It will not work out well. So we're really careful, and I think we stay pretty good with that. I also think, just to go back to, I think, something Nancy said, that we're talking about 20% of our population in terms of students with special needs. If we look at ELL, it varies more the elementary. It's more, and Amherst, less so the secondary. We're not talking about a very small percentage of our population. Yeah. So I think, I mean, I've heard those concerns from parents as well. I agree with everything mm -hmm. Dr. Brady said about carefully balancing the classes so that, uh, all the classes, but, you know, it's a pretty decent percentage of our school population. So there, there's going to be some variance mm -hmm. if you're doing co-teaching higher or lower, uh, but it's not that every student with special needs will be in a co-taught class, even in a grade level if there is <coughs> one. Um, bless you. Um, so I just think sometimes yeah. when you say that number 20 percent, which I know some of the social norms campaign that CPAC worked on, it really helps contextualize this is one of every five students in the district and very similar to state averages. Um, so, you know, yeah. there's variations on that, right? Uh, some higher, some lower, but it's 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 not an insignificant percentage of our students in general. And, it, and it's worth noting that some of our students who have IEPs are also exceptionally talented in certain areas. So we, we don't really 
get a full picture if we think of all those students, that 20%, as being kind of needy across the board. Some of them are exceptionally talented. I see some students with their math reasoning, maybe their calculation skills are challenged, but reasoning, like, um, <laughs> they could be in some of our top classes, and that's where they should be, actually. So. Oh, you're, you're next. Do, do you want um, me or, uh, no, I just want to make some <laughs> comments on the chart that's up here. I am student taught in the second grade, and it worked out so well that I ended up in a three years um, co-teaching mm -hmm. situation. And those that doesn't the students without disabilities doesn't surprise me Good. at all because if you've got two teachers in the classroom you're giving every student just that much more support. Mm -hmm. So they're all going to, you know, the entire class is lifted up socially, emotional, because you've just got that much more attention being paid. Because if you can walk by a desk, even in the middle school, and just, like, tap the, the desk and just smile at the, you know, where a single teacher can't do that. But with the co-teaching, that it, I, th that's a, I think that has a big effect on the entire classroom. Okay. So thank you for sharing that. I think that's important. You, you live that and, life. You know and that. There was a slide. There were two, the two most important things about co-teaching. Um, I'll go and you tell me when to stop. It was one of the very first ones. It was, I, I don't even need to see the slide. It oh, was, okay. the, um, one of the biggest thing to actually for co-teaching to succeed is that the teachers need to be able to check their egos. It, it so I just want to respond to that because we have a lot of students, teachers that come to our district, and one of the things that I think we talk with the universities about is about pre-service teachers. And having experiences where, as a student teacher, you're in a co-teaching classroom. So you don't come out of school always thinking, I can't wait to have my own classroom. I, I think that that's, you know, people go through school and think that they can't wait till it just all belongs to them. And I think we have to dispel those myths that yeah. it doesn't belong I'll to any one person. Also, the ones with the, the charts with the co-teachers, that between 2015 and 2017, you've been working with them. So their comfort level with both each other and the support that they're receiving now, I would hope that it would everything would continue to climb. Right. The pairs haven't stayed the same, so it's hard to, it's hard to know for sure. But what I would say, and like, anecdotally having coached them is that the pairs that have been together since 2015 and are still together now have made um, pretty tremendous progress in their own personal practice and in their work with kids. So I want to make sure everyone can get in who wants to. So I want to go to Mr. Donia's, then take a look around, then go back to Mr. Medina. Thank you. Um, so just very quickly, I, I also want to say thank you to the three of you for presenting tonight. I really appreciate this and um, think this has been wonderful just to really understand, not just about co-teaching, but just the work that's going on in our schools around special education. So I have two questions and a quick comment. Um, um, the, the comment, I'll start with that first, is actually more for Dr. Morris, and it's around the, uh, the comment about the IEP terminology and how confusing it can be. And um, I actually would like to make a recommendation that that be included in the communication plan that was shared um, about the district, because I actually think there's enough confusion mm -hmm. around that, um, that having some sort of regular you know, definition around the terminology would go a very long way in helping parents and families feel more engaged uh, in the work that's going on around their students' education. Um, the quick questions are, so one, I really appreciate uh, the surveys and think it gives us a good snapshot of where people are, but there's a lot of things that happen in between. And of course, especially when you have long periods of time, like between 2010 and 2017, um, changes, you know, perceptions, all of that changes, right? And so I'm wondering what um, can be done to gauge where parents, families, and educators are on a more regular basis. So not just surveys, but also you know active uh, engagement, soliciting information from, from all these different parties. So uh, you want yeah, to jump, go uh, yeah, first, I and then I'll jump. Right. I think um, that CPAC is certainly one huge area where people can do that. 
you know, when we have our monthly meetings, like you have your month, you know, mo monthly meetings that you have are weekly sometimes, you guys. <laughs> uh, but we always have public comment. Um, at the beginning of the year, we had a nice sit down, um, like right over there with the new furniture that you had there and welcome families in and just made ourselves known. Um, we had some building principals pop in, make themselves available. Dr. Brady was there. Joanne was there. Um, so we're always touching. You know, we, we try to reach out to people through email um, and try to make ourselves known that families can reach out and try to communicate with us so that I know that you know, very often if a family is having a difficult time, some people will call me and I will work directly with the building and the parent. Um, I will also, if need be, work with Joanne or Dr. Brady um, because these things pop up not when you have a meeting back in the fall or not when we plan to have it in March, but if your family's in a situation and they need help, you know, CPAC is a spot they can go to. Um, and parents, you know, can reach us in a variety of ways. Um, but at every single IEP meeting um, that is held, we make sure that CPAC information is given out at that meeting as well, too. So we're really trying to make sure that um, there are check-ins there for families. I just want to add, because I think we do all those things, and um, Unfortunately, I guess I kind of live my life thinking about that one person who may be out there who feels that they're not being heard. Um, so what we do do also is ask every staff member, um, certainly every special educator who is working with a family to have routine, regular contact with families that they initiate, not just by email, um, so that we are seeking and just checking in. Um, with people. Um, certainly we know everybody has at least one team meeting a year um, and what we've instituted instead of just sending home a written invitation that comes in the mail and if you're like most people's mailboxes you know that envelope can be kind of lost somewhere. We ask people to call to make a personal contact to say your meeting is coming up just wanting to remind you of that, making sure the time is a good time, and checking in to say, is there anything particular you'd really like to make sure we include that information? There's nothing di worse than getting to a meeting and really wanting to have talked to the English teacher, and the math teacher is there, and the English teacher is not there. So we're trying to do, take more initiative that way, as well as every time we send an IEP home, um, because we know a family needs to read that, or they hopefully read it, but they need to sign something. Otherwise, we're going to keep at them to say, sign something and let us know where you are with that. We sent home a team meeting feedback form um, that's not on the computer, nobody's doing it, that we ask people, because they're all ready with a piece of paper and a pen, we ask them to fill that out and send that back. And we're getting a fairly good response rate. So that information is given right back to the staff at the time, as well as then we tabulate it at the end of each year and send that out so that people have that trend data to look like. Last year, you know, people were telling this school this, and this is what we're hearing this year. So people can really reflect on their practice. Um, so we're running up against the time of our item. Um, do you have anything you want to add? No? Anyone else? Ms. Barrett? Um, I just had one. I don't know if this is more for Dr. Morse, but um, the, so the issue of time was coming up a lot. Um, I'm just, I have some ideas, but I'd just like to know, like, what are the impediments or what are, or what is the plan forward maybe to, to work on that issue or, again, the impediments, you know, preventing from progress there? Sure. I can start and, you know, if, Renee, if you want to jump in, please do. I think it's really different, you know, so this is a presentation at a regional meeting, but the data we're seeing is spans three districts, so I'm going to respond, if it's okay with the chair, to talk about the difference between elementary and secondary. Please do. So at elementary, and, and not that it's perfect and, and I wouldn't claim it, but it, there is a little more flexibility because we have things like recess and we can, we've made amends and kind of informal agreements with folks about recess coverage to provide more time for co-teachers. Uh, there's not that same flexibility at the secondary level of this time where other people can cover and there's not instructional implications. So I think it, it is a more complicated picture at the secondary level than it is at the elementary level. 
And some of it comes down to resources. So I think Mr. Demling's comment uh, and some others at the beginning that if, you know, we had funds to uh, change the FTE allowance for co-teachers to, you know, how much they teach versus how much they have planning, you know, in a perfect world, you know, I'd love to think about how that how to implement that that's fair and equitable. Um, that's not our current scenario. And so one of the challenges is, is the bell schedule at the secondary level doesn't allow for uh, tremendous flexibility on a whole host of fronts, this being one of them. And, and there is a resource issue. And then, the, frankly, there'd be an equity issue as well, because how do you judge how much more planning time a co-teacher needs than a non-co-teacher? That's not an easy math problem to solve, and that would be a lot of conversations with our association to try to work on that if, if we had that level of flexibility, which unfortunately, resource-wise, we don't. I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add. No, I think you covered it. Okay. All right. Um, can I just, if we're going to end, can I end on a positive note? Sure. So I just wanted to tell you that um, we're part of DSAC, which is a subsidiary of DESE. Anyways, there's a whole um, <laughs> inclusive practices network, which is a series of professionals that get together throughout the valley to receive support um, around inclusive practices, co-teaching one of it, one of them. And so we've been working together regionally around how to support area districts. And what I will say is that um, we are doing the work and not many people are doing the work. And area universities are paying attention and we have three student teachers that are here with us this year because their universities are identifying this model as one that they want their pre-services teachers to be around and to see. So I think that that's sort of like an outside inside thing that you should know. Um, and, and, and that's it. So that's, that's extreme, yeah, very positive and I think a great presentation. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if the delay in being able to schedule you ends up being a good thing because it seems like you were extremely well organized and had even more information to bring in there. I mean, if we kept waiting, you'd probably do even more. Uh, and actually, and I was going to say on that note, I mean, to me, this is really a terrific conversation. It's all, it's something, I'm sort of echoing something Mr. Donnie said, in which I wonder whether in your sort of out, out calendar, you should look maybe three years from now to do another survey instead of another seven. Um, and, you know, but, but in that, in the spirit of some of the planning or strategic planning exercises that I've talked a lot about with the superintendent, it would be really wonderful since you've done essentially, here's the journey we've been on, here's what we're hearing, here's how it's improved. Um, and also I'm saying this again, echoing the fact that the budget's kind of tough. And actually I would argue for, for this item as well as frankly the next one we're gonna be talking about, I actually don't think budget times Bad, bad budgets are times where you give up on your aspirations. They're the times in which your aspirations are most challenged, right? Because if you have all the, not that, you, not that you've ever had all the money in the world, but if you had all the money in the world, then you can throw money at problems and see if anything works out and just try a bunch of things. When um, time budgets are tight, then you're sort of doubling down on what you think is working effectively and what you think your classrooms, your educators, and your students need the most. And so my point on this is that c coming to where we are now in this conversation, um, you can talk amongst yourselves about when the next time would be. It could even be this coming fall. Um, but I think there's there's a logical next point of conversation with the school committee on, on not only what have you learned and reflected, but now that we're taking stock and looking ahead for the next, you know, till the next survey. Uh, I mean, you've made so much progress from, as you described at the beginning, from where you were seven years ago to where you're reported to be now. What's the next aspiration? What's the next goal? And, and regardless of the budget, how do we support you and gain visibility around that? I just think that's a really, we didn't get a chance to do that here, and maybe you're not ready to do that now, but I think there's got to be a next opportunity. It could be sometime in the spring, it could be next fall, whenever it is. I think it'd be a wonderful thing to do. Really? Yeah, I mean, I don't need to extend the time too, too yeah. much, but I, I don't know if we if we did enough to uh, um, to thank you and to, to emphasize. Um, and you mentioned this a couple times at the beginning how dramatic a, a, an improvement that is between the, the surveys, the two surveys. Um, and it's when you compare, it, I mean, other districts across the state, across the country that are really struggling, many in crisis over how to deal with increasing percentages of special ed, and this is this is a real success story. You know, in in a public school district, right? Um, that's in a per fairly progressive uh, way, and so um, 
you know, whether that's sharing with um, the, the regional uh, group that you mentioned um, or, or at the state level, promising practices, um, it's, it's definitely something I think as a school committee we want to continue to, to um, shine a light on. And aspire to do even more, <laughs> as we're able to. And, and I just want to say we thank you for your support to help us do the work. I think, you know, we are fortunate enough to be in a district that keeps students at the center and makes our decisions based upon our students. Um, and when you do that, success usually follows. So thank you for your support and guidance. Thank you. Thank have, you. A, have a thank safe you uh, trip thank home you. if you're leaving now. Thank you so much. Uh, so the next item on our agenda is the school equity, school equity task force goal discussion is what it's called on our agenda. Um, we as as the it's kind of funny we had a joint regional school committee SETF meeting in November November 14th and so the awkward thing is I've been I mean since a bunch of people of the committee were there at that meeting I don't feel like I need to remind you that we had the meeting but for anyone I guess like for the myriad of people watching at home. Um, I just want to put this in the context that um, we've had a couple of meetings, a couple of joint meetings um, with, with the school, school equity task force this um, fall. Um, I, I personally enjoyed them, learned a lot from them, and uh, am inspired with the work of the SCTF. Uh, the, 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 I want, and I'm also, by the way, I want to hand this to Ms. Dominique Cage to introduce, but um, the, uh, to me, the meeting we had in November in which we were uh, given the opportunity to review a memo that described a series of, of goals or, or, or broad scale objectives or visions that uh, the SCTF had compiled, some of which have been around for a while, um, but uh, for years and have been worked on for years. But this was an excellent, in my opinion, an excellent summary of, of the uh, objectives that the SCTF had been working on and an opportunity for the community to be able to uh, engage around that and then I think more importantly one of the things that was described in that meeting um, was I, I think I, I don't think I'd be speaking out of turn to say frustration at some point but also just a concern that um, that it's 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 fine to pick a particular item on an agenda push it fund it make some progress or whatever but then the question is you know nine months from now um, do we make any progress? Do we bother reviewing that progress? To the extent that these are interrelated uh, goals, are those goals ever ever discussed or looked at in a holistic way, integrative way? Are they benchmarked? Um, since, I mean, we just signed a contract, so we're hoping you're here for a, a long time, and we love you, it's great. Um, but, but the reality is uh, leadership comes and goes too, either from individual schools or overall. And one of the concerns was that when you look year to year or even decade to decade, is there continuity um, in the terms of a structure of the strategy, benchmarking your progress, and then being able to review that progress in a way that's both aspirational, engages the community in a way that's really helpful, and then also engages the staff and the leadership in a way in which you're making concrete crowd progress so that you're not talking about, you're not always talking about aspirations. It's kind of, forgive me for saying this, um, Day after Dr. King's birthday, but um, one of as much as I, I mean, I, I really revere Dr. King, deeply revere and admire Dr. King. One of the things what can be very frustrating and challenging about the holiday, though, is that see people focus on the dream and they focus on the dream speech and they don't focus necessarily on the organizing or actually the concrete legislative and other practical accomplishments that were actually done either doc during Dr. King's life, many other civil rights leaders or in the decades subsequent, right? And the bottom line is you can have a dream, that's great, but if you're not actually making real progress for families that can feel and touch and see, uh, all it is all it is, is a, a, a dream deferred, to paraphrase or quote someone else. So my point being on this is I think, that, I think this was, in my mind, I'm just introducing the fact that we received this document, we had, I thought, a very good conversation, but then the, the <coughs> challenge for the committee and then the conversation, I think, with the superintendent, the assistant superintendent, is in fact what's next and what do we want to do about about uh, about this? Is that too long? That was probably too long. No, apologize. No, we just playing footsie. You're playing footsie? No, I'm just kidding. Oh, goodness. Uh, 
<laughs> That's kind of took me down. It was like Courtney Langston Sorry. Hughes a moment ago. Now <laughs> it's very saying, beautiful. Uh, uh, so, anyways, I, I want to offer offer uh, just Dominic an opportunity to also introduce the discussion. Sure. Um, I, I I really don't know how you um, how the committee would want to proceed, and but I I just would want to give the framework perhaps. Sure. Um, that I think the document um, we don't have it in our packet, but. We don't? Um, we don't. We I should. don't believe we have, we have it in our copy right here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but it, it lays out, it, it, you know, essentially how do you build out a restorative justice program um, from a position that the district um, has uh, secured? Um, we have a person, um, DW, who's in the high school. How do we support the um, success of the? Of the position, um, how do we build out a program around the position? Um, and I was part of a, 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 a working group meeting session that um, a couple of uh, school equity task force members uh, were a part of that I was able to join in with the principal and with with the uh, DW. And so I was able to see um, the timeline and, and all of that. And I, I guess why we're having this conversation is. Um, is that the, the school equity task force wants to get that type of, um, it's going to require money, money for professional development for um, the position um, and also pro uh, trainings uh, for students because we want youth to be trained. We want youth to be exposed to other um, uh, restorative justice programs that are nearby. Um, and so, you know, we, there is a, it's not a, a apparently ready yet for, um, to, to be shared publicly. However, um, this, as Mary Lou's um, letter, you know, sort of outlined nicely, this is imperative for um, the social emotional experience of students in terms of how do we provide students the tools to do conflict um, resolution to mediate um, disagreements and also to to do that reflection about how we interact with each other in the world and and in a, you know even with teachers and, and adults in the building like there's a lot of um, the the support that's outlined in, in, in this memo that um, I think was electronically shared uh, at some point before um, also talks about um, making sure that the entire, you know, sort of the building, not just the building, but just, you know, what makes up the community in, in a building, um, that we expose people to that restorative justice practice, principles, values, and, and, and training. So, so essentially that's, that's what we're talking about. And I just want to say, you know, outside of what the school equity task force um, has outlined, I think that since this is not a district-wide, you know, sort of layout, um, that, you know, definitely one person doing it is, is a challenge. So, you know, ideally, you know, we would have other people in other buildings um, doing similar work to share, you know, the, 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 val the, the strengths of restorative justice. So I'm... Um I thought we were talking about something different, to be honest with you. Uh, I mean, that restorative justice is a strong component of it, but I, when in in November we got a memo in which there were outlined five different uh, top of the line goals, uh, and then underneath them were a series of requests for things that um, that would need to be implemented and funded. And so it was a question of a dialogue, I think, with the superintendent around. Um, around uh, the feasibility of them, what we're doing now. And just among those, just to give examples, number one was broaden and deepen the learning of faculty, staff, <laughs> and administration about race and racism, with special emphasis on systemic racism and unconscious bias. And uh, item A in there was to direct the administration to add $30,000 to the FY19 budget uh, and earmark it for professional development uh, to support that activity, for example. There are other examples. Uh, number two was broaden and deepen the learning of students about race, class, and other equity issues. And item A for that um, was to 
um, uh, fund and uh, essentially spur the development of a high school course on race class and other equity issues. Uh, as it says here, this would most likely be an elective course, but might become part of grading a graduation requirement that all students take at least one course to fulfill this overall goal and other items. Number three was increase the enrollment in successive students of color and low-income white students in honors and AP classes in high school and item A, which I think would be extraordinarily useful for us to do, uh, is to ask the administration to provide data and, and have a presentation on what the current enrollment is in honors and AP classes um, is broken down by a variety of demographic characteristics, including income and race as available, uh, and to come up with an action plan to expand participation in those courses. Uh, number four was eliminate racial disparities in discipline of students at both the middle school and high school. Uh, uh, and this includes, obviously it speaks directly to restorative justice, uh, and it includes, among other things, ask the administration to provide data that show the quantity and duration of all disciplinary actions that involve students missing instruction disaggregated by grade, race, and gender, uh, including longitudinal data if it's available. Uh, and then five, uh, increase the percentage of people of color in each category of school district employees annually until it approximately equals the percentage of students of color. Uh, which again, um, we, we've talked a little bit about this already, but there are a variety of things we're listed in here, some of which are data and others of which are based on reporting and goals and objectives in that category. So it was, it was my thought, and I apologize this wasn't in, in everyone's packet to sort of fresh the memory of the meeting we had. It was my intention, one, to have an opportunity for the committee to discuss, uh, for those especially who were able to attend, um, the goals that were there. Um, I'm going to speak out of turn by saying that in my mind, if you start with the top level goals that I mentioned that I read first under each one of these, um, I, I'm speaking out of turn, I apologize, but I'd be surprised if the committee wouldn't endorse all of them, but I think it's actually a useful step for the committee to endorse all of them if the committee's predisposed to do so. And then, uh, to me, the next question underneath that, which again, I was hoping to encourage with the dialogue with the superintendent and super assistant superintendent, was um, essentially what do we, where do we go from here to try to make um, meaningful public and continuous progress on these goals in a way that also, um, and forgive me for saying this, but breaks down a dynamic in which sort of we're over here and you're over there uh, and we're saying you should do this, but rather the question is how do we create a team approach that, that creates with the public and with us and with all of you and the professionals, um, again, transparency, clarity around goals and objectives and progress. And so I, I was hoping we could do that at least as a starting point in this meeting, so that we could also look out over the course of the spring about figuring out both how do we build this into the budget where it's relevant in a tough time, but also how do we, um, and forgive me for picking on them, but sort of the, 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 the Rick Hood um, uh, challenge, um, which is also actually a bit the Kathleen Anderson challenge, of, uh, hey, I've been at this a long time, I see stops and starts, how do we do something that actually feels like an honest to God uh, collective collaborative strategy in which we're really making progress and benchmarking our accomplishments. And so that's why I was bringing it up because I thought it, it, the SETF can ask us to do stuff till the cows come home. The committee's got to decide whether and work with you to decide whether we want to actually do something collectively. Is it nice? And if I can just make Please. Uh, one additional comment. I, I um, thank you for that, Mr. Nakajima and Mr. Romney Cage. I think that that's exactly uh, the conversations that we've had in the equity task force meetings. Um, but also, I think, you know, from uh, my own perspective, at, at the end of the day, we really want to integrate uh, the Equity Task Force's work wholly into the work of the committee, right, and the work of the district, so that there's no longer a need for a separate subcommittee, but in fact that it's actually part of the work that we do on a regular basis. And a lot of the, um, the work, I think, that, that needs to get done, in, if, if I may be so bold, is to ensure that each one of our agendas, right, ar you know, around our meetings on a regular basis, reflect these goals and reflect the needs of our district in terms of equity and trying to achieve uh, racial and social justice. And I think we've all agreed across the board that this is important, this is a priority, and that we want this to happen. And the very fact that Ms. Cunningham is here, sitting here today, uh, reflects that that commitment. And so. 
I think a lot of the, you know, the, the again, Mr. Hood's repeated conversation has really been about what are we doing, how do we know we're getting it done, and I think a lot of the, the answer in that lies in, in tracking this progress, right, and making sure that we're reflecting that on a regular basis. It's not just once in a while that we have a conversation around right. some of this, but that it's really integrated into your goals, the superintendent's goals, and it's integrated into our regular agendas, and integrated into a lot of our conversations um, on a regular basis. Yeah, no, just hazard. Do you want to respond to that? I was going to jump in on the something. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, ahead. I just, um, at our um, last superintendent evaluation subcommittee, we actually had this as an agenda item. So I, if I may, yes. can I read a little bit from our minutes because it kind of describes the discussion that we have, which I think is right along the lines sure. of this. So um, the subcommittee agreed. So this, uh, we sort of were looking at, okay, how, looking at these goals, which are, you know, Im ambitious, and we have, you know, about six months left in this year, and sort of what, what that might look like for this year. The subcommittee agreed that a helpful step could be to get a thorough report on what is being done, how it can be tracked, and how the public can keep tabs on this work. It was noted that the goal for this year could be to set the stage for the work ahead through a thorough report that looks at trends and frames these goals as a multi-year process. Ms. Marriott expressed that it might be a good step to have updates around these topics built into the yearly school committee calendar providing check-ins every year on areas such as achievement gap, discipline disparity, etc. Ms. Hazard suggested that there be a map of professional development that is currently happening around racism, social justice, implicit bias, etc. And this would allow the committee and the public to see what is currently being done and where there may be gaps. It was agreed that we need a clear sense of the baseline so we could determine where we need to improve and how the school committee can help. An important question to consider is how to make this process successful so that the SETF administration and the school committee can work together effectively. That's great. Anything in that, let me add, um, the thing I was going to add to that is because I've had a little bit of dialogue with the superintendent around this, and if, I, if I'm going to do a minor betrayal of your confidence, I very clever, that, um, <laughs> whatever that means. Um, but as long but, as you announce it publicly, right? Yeah, no, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, no, that, I mean, no, I, I'm, I'm kidding only because it's not going to be, an, it's not going to be yeah. a mystery to anyone, that um, looking ahead at this budgetary year, one of the concerns you had uh, is that um, it, it's kind of what I said earlier. It's e it's easier to talk about aspirational goals when you're saying budget ads, position ads, and all that kind of stuff, right? It's much harder to. It, it, I mean, just objectively, it's harder to have a conversation about this stuff when when you're either doing levels level of funding in some areas or even cuts and um, in our conversations, one of the things we discussed was that, you know, at least in my view, and I think you shared it, is that in some ways it's actually an opportunity, right? Yeah. Because in a situation where, you know, you're not talking about getting a specific grant, not that that isn't valuable, it is valuable. You're not talking about particular hires in saying what's the profile of the hires, isn't this great, we're furthering our objectives. You're actually forced to describe a strategy in greater detail and describe what your year-to-year efforts are. And I'll give an example within hiring, professional development, faculty retention, <laughs> all the stuff you do <laughs> for quite a while. Um, you know, the, the reality is you're, you're doing all this work anyway, right? And you're going to be thinking about all sorts of ways that you can match the objective of improving the effectiveness of the Alana cabinet and the different programs that fall out of it, professional development, where, you, where there are any hires or that filling of positions that needs to occur, thinking about ways of, of, of aggressively looking for ways of doing hires that, that could advance this objective. Um, I think there's a great teachable moment, an opportunity to break it down and make it plain and help people understand what it, what does it actually look like to have a three to five year um, effort in a situation which is probably not going to get financially a lot more generous right. um, to still make it, it advances on these these goals, right? Like that, I mean, it's a challenge, it's hard, but I think it's an opportunity to settle, to get very, very real and have really great dialogue between the leadership, uh, the administrative leadership of the district, the committee and the public, parents and staff. And that follow, obviously I'm saying this because it echoes and adds upon what Ms. Hazard, uh, Ms. Ardonia's and how Ms. Marriott was quoted. Mr. Um, so maybe towards the end of this discussion we can better articulate 
what the specific action item mm -hmm. uh, next thing is as opposed to just we're going to discuss it yeah next because we have as you've foreshadowed a lot of budget stuff about to hit us right um, and um, so you know I agree with the general sentiment we're talking about about let's set out the plan let's make it more transparent and defined than it's been in the past let's get the baseline mm -hmm. track progress I, I just want to make real sure that we're setting expectations with SETF and with the public appropriately mm -hmm. as we go through this um, because I, so especially without the, the goals in front of me from the memo but in particular without an in-depth discussion about each one of those goals mm -hmm. I wouldn't I wouldn't feel comfortable um, saying no or yes to any of those requests and, I mean some of those requests were very specific about mm -hmm. um, funding for specific line items and specific specific amounts and you know that's a whole context of the budget and so um, I, I don't want to I want to be cautious about giving the wrong impression um, yeah. as we go through a pretty volatile budget cycle I guess it's just my own I think that reaction. I think that makes sense I mean I probably wasn't speaking as bluntly as I could have a moment ago um, our budget stinks and there's not going to be a lot of money for anything from what I can tell we're going to learn more next week in detail um, and so in that context this is actually really about digging deep in your values and in your expertise because it's actually probably not I mean I'm, I'm very serious about this is there's two elements to it one when you look at some of the specific requests for ads if we're not in an environment for ads then the likely answer for this coming fiscal year is well I'm not sure we can do that now I'm not sure we can do that now right I mean that may very well be the, the realistic answer when we get to budgeting and so the question ends up being and I think Frankly, one of my outcomes of this meeting would like to be to actually define a question or a challenge for the superintendent to say we would like at X meeting in the future or Y meeting in the future for you to come back with your thoughts about how you'd like to proceed. Uh, uh, you know, on what's your response? And I think it, even a good baseline. I think Mr. Jones might have said this. Or Ms. Azard, I forget one of the two of you made the comment that um, you can start as a baseline of what are we doing now and what is the data telling us, and then. But my point is the framework of it, it seems to me, could reasonably be um, a lot of the top line goals that are here. And so there has to, so my point is there has to be a response. And to me, that goes back to, again, to make it speak very plainly, that goes back to my point a moment ago about building trust by being extremely transparent, breaking things down, and being really clear about what you're trying to do. If we look out over the next three to five years, this is probably not the last lousy budget we're going to have. And there's also going to be opportunities where there are going to be potentially good budgets. So if we have a conversation with the superintendent, with the assistant superintendent and others, and then with the public at large, that's focused around, are you going to um, uh, recommend allocating $15,000 for this out of the other thing? Then what we're going to do is we're going to get into a, a sort of a sort of broad discursive fistfight around specific line items and dollar figures that if especially in, a, in a, a situation of constrained budgets is going to miss the point of well wait a minute what are our guidance counselors doing now well how are, is there a way they can optimize what they're doing is there a way in which we can optimize the engagement of parents or teachers and students with them now with the staff we have now that could substantially object advance these objectives even in the absence of budget meaning my point being to end this because i don't want to try to fill i'm not trying to filibuster this item is is that if we're in a tight budget year and the superintendent and i'm not you never said this so i'm <laughs> pretending the words you might say um say well you know the budget really stinks this year therefore you know it's not realistic for us to really address any of these goals if that were the answer right. then i would say well that means you're not committed to them at all because there's always going to be times where you have tough budgets right so so the point being on this is i suspect some of the items and i'm not going to pick on them because i'm not going to pick on them some of these items we may not be able to fund this year what i'd like to know from the superintendent and the assistant superintendent and others is all right what's your response how are we how are we engaging and making progress on this and how are we doing things that can build between this year and next year where we can see progress and i don't think that's too much to ask because i think that's what we need and it's what we need, frankly, to know that whenever we have money again, or if we can seek additional, I mean, I think the para thing is great, by the way. I love that. Meaning the, the stepped educational program mm -hmm. pathways. I think it's a wonderful thing to do. That's a wonderful grant to go after. But my point is, unless 
grant, unless we just willy-nilly take whatever grants come, that grant um, that fits beautifully within objectives that are expressed right here, right? So it fits with the strategy. And so my point is, how would you even know if the next dollar was spent well if a dollar came available? Unless you can already articulate um, what's working and how you're, how you're moving and how we're making progress on these goals. And that's what we need to do. Sorry. Please. You have your own 25 minutes now, if you want. No, <laughs> uh, I don't, actually. Oh, I, I, thank you. But I'm just going to take you up on that. Um, so so uh, a couple things. First of all, this dialogue is really helpful. Uh, I don't want to speak for Ms. Cunningham, but it's helpful for me um, to process um, kind of where the committee is or individual members are. Um, I think a couple points, a few points that I'd like to make. One is there's no disagreement on the five goals that are listed as being really important. And to the last point that was raised, um, the way you approach them is probably the dialogue that needs to occur, right? Is I don't feel personally like there's anything in terms of those five goals that uh, that we disagree with. I think they're very consistent with the district's values and, and core principles. And I think to Mr. Nakajima's point in challenging budget years, um, right, what I read as to ABC, you know, the letters, going down are, are certainly reasonable ways to approach it that may or may not be feasible that doesn't invalidate the, the importance of the goal, right? So for me, it's a way, how are we currently approaching it? How do we get a benchmark of where we are and what's the strategy? What are strategies mm -hmm. moving forward? That's the dialogue that I think would be most helpful. I think another person commented it's mid-January, um, and I think that's both an opportunity to do some benchmarking uh, as well as to sh some strategic planning and get that process, which I'll speak a little bit later uh, on a different agenda topic about uh, going in terms of what are the future kind of aspirations of the district and how do we, co how do we codify that work, uh, not only, and this was referenced earlier, to be an SEF piece, but part of the district practices and how does that actually intersect and interweave with other things that are on this list that are also truly important to the district. And, and I think there's some benefit to looking holistically at what we want to do as a district bringing these and bringing the SETF into that strategic planning process so the outcome is not there's SETF goals and there's these goals and there's that goal. They all may be really good, but if they're not woven together into a more comprehensive plan, uh, I don't want to isolate things because it, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it'll work well. It's not because I am opposed to this group or that group or these plans. We could come up with 100 goals that would be all look great on paper, and I think the reality is we need to figure out how do we do something comprehensively uh, very publicly with incredible amounts of community engagement, not just the people in the room, but lots of people who aren't in the room, including students, uh, and get to a place of what is a tangible, finite number of goals that we then can build moving forward. Um, the last thing I want to say, and certainly Ms. Cunningham, if you'd like to jump in, is um, I, I took the five uh, recommendations to be very affirming of the work that um, and the efforts that we're making right now, and not that we have it all figured out, or not that uh, things are perfect. If they were, we probably would be having a very different conversation. Uh, at the same time, it feels very supportive to read this document and to hear this dialogue, because uh, we want to be in step and in sync with the committee on these matters um, mm -hmm. and the SETF. So, you know, I really appreciate the work of the SETF as well as the work of the committee to kind of engender more dialogue that's um, iterative. Um, and involves people, you know, this, again, this will be my push, not just the people in this room, but lots of people not in this room to engage in it. Because one thing we know is top-down kind of style of management where people don't feel engaged and aren't able to interact with the ideas doesn't have a great track record of success in any domain, you know, equity being one of them. That doesn't prevent us from having urgency on them, but how do we engage a larger group of stakeholders um, to understand the concerns, to understand kind of the direction we want to take, and then to take part in it? Because uh, People in this room aren't the ones directly teaching kids on a daily basis or being counselors or um, being involved in the restorative justice. Uh, the last thing I want to say, and then I'll really turn it if Ms. Cunningham <laughs> wants to add, is it's just interesting, you know, um, I'm, I'm glad the group met with DW. Thank you for that, that update, Ms. Wyman Cage. So this afternoon, I was doing, uh, Amherst Media was doing kind of one of our tapings. This wasn't the update. I didn't say it out loud. And what was interesting was two elementary school principals and said, you know, what's, what's going on in your school? The community might want to know. They might not be aware of And both of them spoke about restorative practices and restorative justice in their elementary school settings and how that's changing the culture around consequences discipline. And, and my question was really this kind of generic softball, you know, get people talking about their schools. And that's, that's where they went. So I do think having at a high school, large comprehensive high school, having someone who kind of owns a program, it's not to speak against that, but I also think 
Um, a lot of it's around, and DW would say this, around changing culture, right, and changing climate, and uh, how that operates um, is going to look a little different in the different schools based on size, based on uh, current situation, and, and a host of other factors. But I've spoken more than I thought <laughs> I was going to, so, uh, but Ms. Cunningham, uh, feel free to jump in. So I do want to also thank the SETF and um, the goals that they've put here are, are goals that we have been working towards. Um, one of the things I'd like to say, though, is that we need to make things more transparent because there's a lot of things that are listed here that we have been working towards and making progress with. However, we have not um, made it transparent to the community or others at large to say, this is what we're doing, this is how we're doing, or even to, once again, get the input from those stakeholders who are not in the room. So yes, I'd like to thank you guys for this and just know that we are making progress and we'd like to find ways to make it more transparent for all to know that we are doing this work. So the other day, um, Ms. Marion, I think you started to articulate in a meeting with the superintendent some things you might like to see happen this spring. Well, I think we've touched on uh, what I was what I was talking about was, and I think it's along the baseline and some of, and it kind of feeds into the transparency part. You know, s some of these goals have a lot of requests for data, and I think that's something that that we can do very soon, right? And that's probably a good thing for us to tackle in this shortened shortened period. And then again, finding you know ways to regularly share and re and come back to these topics so either sharing out what's going on but also just let's get an update where are we and make sure that it's constantly on the radar not something that we check in once about once a year but or every other year or something but on a regular basis so i think operationalizing some of that stuff would be would be excellent to accomplish this spring uh yeah i i, I 100 percent agree with that and i think that um that was I was going to ask because I think Mr. Nakajima had just mentioned something about uh, maybe uh, requesting that the superintendent and the assistant superintendent, um, you know, sort of share with us their thinking about when we might be able to expect some feedback on these recommendations and these goals. Um, I think just having that concretely as something to look forward to mm -hmm. would help a lot with the conversation and, and the agenda setting for ourselves mm -hmm. um, and I think you know that the, the data request again is something that has been continuing for such a long time that um, if that information is already being collected it would be great to hear it as soon as we can mm -hmm. um, and for that then to become a regular part of reporting back mm -hmm. Um, there's other things, of course, that you know are going to have to be considered more within the context of the budget setting, and so right. you're probably going to need a little bit more time, or that you know there's going to have to be input from the committees on that. Right. Um, but I think at, at the very least, beginning with that, and then the other thing that I would just pitch is one thing that we keep hearing over and over again is, and this comes to Ms. Cunningham's sort of bailiwick, is a professional development piece, and so the pathways thing is extremely important, but then also. Um, other, you know, aspects of professional development mm -hmm. and staff training yeah. around equity and racial justice and how they, um, perhaps it becomes incorporated into the regular PD kind of work that goes on and training throughout the year, uh, looking at other programs that maybe are not just sort of strictly, you know, quote unquote education based, but also, you know, mm -hmm. incorporate an aspect or elements of equity. Um, in that, you know, that, that would be your mm -hmm. decisions to make, right? But I think um, having some kind of regular reporting on, on the progress mm -hmm. on that piece would also be extremely helpful just in understanding what's going on. So that's all I just wanted to say. So, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just gonna, I was gonna add to that and just say, so um, uh, in a moment, I'm gonna look around the table and see if people are nodding. I don't know if anybody can vote on this, <laughs> but I'd love to see if people are, who is that? No, so that is there's there's feedback, feedback from the uh, Who is there? <laughs> Huh. We're in a stadium now. Oh, I can hear that. Yeah. That is weird. <laughs> now, betting, um, betting, betting. <laughs> Mr. Nakajima. Stefan Diggs scoring the touchdown. He's in your mind. Uh, New Orleans Saints. Um, uh, exactly. Uh, all right, I'm just going to continue, even though that is kind of weird. Um, can we close that door? So, oh, that might be that said. I don't know. Be an interesting question. Um, so I, I was just going to say that I, I, I agree with what was just said. I also want to try to find a way to make this workable from a schedule standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's so there are a couple of things I'd love to see 
happen and see if this is, makes sense and just get your feedback on this. I mean, one, I think you should just pick some data points on here, although if I can pick on one that I really want to hear about. I keep hearing for a really long time, I remember like a year ago, I was on a candidate forum, um, and I was hearing about the question of whether or not all children are sort of equally participating and benefiting from AP courses mm -hmm. and sort of enriched courses. And I haven't seen any data on that. And so if I'd love to just see data on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know that's here. I'm sorry I'm picking on one of the things and sort of prioritize it. But if you have information on that, it's just one of those things where like there's already lots of common knowledge or popular knowledge around discipline rates and things like that and challenges where it's sort of like known that that's a problem in reality and statistically. There's also a known sort of challenge around staffing patterns and, and the diversity of staff. This is one where I actually haven't seen the data. And if it really, I'd love to see the data. Anyways, my point is though, but the point is if that isn't ready or can't be ready, we should pick something on here mm -hmm. and start talking about it and talking about it in a really grounded way, mm -hmm. ideally with data, and then also what are we doing now and how's it working. Because um, I think that would be a good educational process for us, but also the community. I think it goes to something that uh, Ms. Cunningham was saying a moment ago around if there are things that are happening now that actually fundamentally reach some of these goals, but the public's unaware of it, let's start making people aware of it. Not that it can't be improved, right. but it also there's, just, there's way too bad a disconnect if we're actually making progress on some of these things, but nobody knows it's happening. Mm -hmm. And so we should close that gap and pick a couple of them. But then the challenge, the challenge also then and I think, unfortunately, as educational leader, you're stuck with it, is you, you've got to come back with us with also the, a sort of more holistic framework around how we organize an ongoing, very tied to the budget, right. tied to all this other stuff. How do we, how do we organize that? We need, we need some sort of framework to respond to. As, as was suggested, I don't think we need to hold up hearing some of the data and some of the updates on these items for that framework if it takes a little longer to do. Does this make any sense, by the way? We're nuts, just let us know. No, not at all. Um, so um, I just want to quickly respond. So I think when I look at the goals, things that uh, we haven't talked about this, um, but no goal number one and goal number five seem like the ones that probably that the data is more there and that yeah. we're actively working on. Oh, that's good. <laughs> we agreed. Um, um, the thing on the data more generally that I do want to um, state is that we have two analysts, data analysts for the district who work for three districts. So essentially of 1.06 FTE dedicated to data that have to do an awful incredible amount of data reporting. We used to have more. It was a budget cut years ago. Um, we are not in a um, situation where our resources towards gathering data and, and like number three, I don't disagree, is a very worthwhile, you know, what you were talking about. That, um, our capacity to do that quickly is pretty limited, and that's something that we may have to talk about in the budget process. Um, but I think there's been a large public interest in having more access to data. I personally have more interest. I think the current budget situation makes that a kind of challenging situation. I'll talk a little bit more about that next week, not just the budget situation, but uh, this particular um, aspect of it. Um, but is one person essentially one FTE that's dedicated to not just gathering this data for us, most of their job is around power school and state reporting and those types of things. So I think that's some of our limitation is, is not lack of desire or interest, it's how much can one person, you know, or two people split between three districts, however you want to frame it, um, take on to do longitudinal as well as current data analysis. Um, and that's not to say we don't want to do it, it's about the timeliness um, and that's our current reality, that's what kind of as a district we've chosen to put uh, funds more directly, you know, tied to children's daily experience than we have in that realm, and whether that's the right choice or wrong choice, probably should be a discussion we have um, sometime this winter. Uh, even despite the challenges, um, it's a current limitation, um, and it's a point of frustration. Do you think? Um, what do you think? Of, I'm, I think I'm getting lost in the trees instead of the forest. Oh, I'm sorry. I, didn't uh, to I apologize. <laughs> um, so, do you think the idea of being able to do a, do some near-term presentations on what we're doing yeah. and what the data shows is realistic? And do you think that they'll, the longer term, but not like forever term? Because like, right. you know, yeah. sometimes your announcement is, hey, here's how we're thinking of going about it. Right. Then you go about it, right? Like, is, is, do you think that idea of helping to give something for the committee to respond to 
um, you know, and, and again, I'm ask, I'm not asking you to do this now, yeah, yeah. but at some point you're going to have to sort of give reflection, reflective feedback on, is this like a March presentation? Is it a February presentation? Is it an April one? I mean, I don't know, but the point is we'll, we'll figure that out together based on everything else that's going on. Yeah, I think I, I'm number one and number five, I, I'm not tremendously worried about gathering the data or doing that in a, in a very timely way. I do, I am concerned that once next Tuesday happens and we start talking about budget, mm -hmm. the metaphorical space that we have to talk about things that aren't uh, budget um, will be somewhat reduced, not eliminated, mm -hmm. but but I, I also don't want to do this at 9.30 after a meeting where we've had tremendous numbers of public comment talking about potential budget reductions. I don't right. think that is a justice. So I think I'm not so worried about the timing on our end of being able to put something together in the next, for the next couple months. It's more just, is that the right fit in terms of time? And I don't think we'll know until we get there to a certain extent, till you know, we get to next week's presentation, the Fort Town meeting, see if we get resolution on at least what our current situation is yeah. and the response to the proposed budget reductions. Um, so I don't want to game it by saying, well, no, we can't talk about March because maybe things will work out as challenging as they are smoother than what's in my well, head I don't, right I mean, now. I don't, really, I, mean, I don't really quite mean it exactly that way. I mean, I think in terms of sequencing the meetings and how packed are the agendas and where do we fit things in, right. um, we can figure that out, right? Yeah. Because we're going to have things we have to do. Mm -hmm. uh, we just, we're going to have to work that out. But it's also, if we, if, if let's say I don't know the January 30th meeting, you come back with, I've been had a chance to give some thought to right, this. Right. Here's the general way I'm thinking about mm -hmm. proceeding, and we get some opportunity to respond to that. Then, then you know that gives you a chance to reflect for a little bit, and and roadmap out what things would look like between now and August or whatever. And because the, the entire point is, I mean, I'm not to be funny about this, no, no, not, but if if you never go through that process because we're trying to we're limping crisis to crisis, right. then we're always kicking the can down the road That's another right. couple months, right? Yeah. Because, there, because my point is I'm being respectful of the fact that if, if one in five are things you could talk about sooner, then we've got to put item number three somewhere on the calendar, right? So that maybe that is something you don't talk about until September right. because it takes time to do. But at least if we have an agreement yeah. that you're going to do it in September, Absolutely. then the, per, the one FTE or 1.06 FTE mm -hmm. or whatever it was, they slot it in at different right. points, and then by the time we get to September, we have the data, we Absolutely. can have the conversation. Yeah. And, and that's that's exactly what I, I'm sorry, Mr. Don Kitch, apologies. That's what I meant earlier when I said, you know, this is what, to me, this is what it means to slog through the work of making progress, is that is, is being reality-based, knowing that there are going to be staffing challenges, it is going to be tough to do something right. at a given point. So then the question is, how do we figure out when we're going to do it? And then let's hold collectively our feet to the fire that when the time comes, we're able to, we're able to engage. Yeah. Uh, and so on, you know, on January 30th, if you're able to come back with some kind of a, whatever <laughs> feedback you have, yeah. essentially, that would be extremely helpful. That makes a lot sense to me. Uh, in terms of format, I think that, um, you know, working out of this document, um, I think there was another document that followed this um, that was specific to, you know, the RJ. Um, uh, priority, if you um, will, um, because I think we want a sense of what is priority, um, and 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 also that this is a living document that you know we've presented, and then you know what is the response from the district in terms of where we are, and that would be written, and then we would you know be able to see what was the response in 2018, you know, end of the school year. And then, you know, what happens in the end of 29, you know, like mm -hmm. tracking progress and, you know, so, so that way you know, we can check off, you know, mm -hmm. when things are done mm -hmm. or we're making, you know, progress towards that goal. Um, and, and also I think this is, you know, I think the School Equity Task Force is aware that, um, you know, it's, 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 a lot of this is very detailed and in, in, in the very weeds sometimes, um, but that we're requiring, you know, your um, sort of big picture um, knowledge and wisdom about how to execute it in a way that's doable. Um, so thinking creatively, like if we're paying for Greenfield Community College courses, for example, here, you know, can one of those courses be a you know racial justice or a restorative justice class where you know where we can pull some students to be trained 
Um, I know that um, Amherst Education Foundation grant money is being pursued to help um, with some of this. And, you know, so, so that type of commitment towards, you know, getting, you know, these things into our district, you know, being able to track that in, you know, in, in one document, that's what we're going for. Um, and, and I think it is a, a challenge to, to have a, a committee conversation and discussion. I think at this point, I, I, you know, we, we, didn't, we don't have that full, you know, we haven't had the ability to have this full conversation. Um, but maybe if we can see what your response is um, officially on this, with the, you know, in terms of number one or A, and this is the response, then that way the, the committee can actually see you know, and, and get, go deeper. That that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. And also, at some point, um, you know, Principal Mark Jackson and, and, and DW can come in and sort of um, do their presentation that some of us were um, privy to in, in that smaller working group. I think that would be helpful, very, very helpful, because that is an identified priority for um, the School Equity Task Force. Feel like you have uh, yeah. good feedback? I do. Right. Thank you. So we're we're um, we're we were on time, and now we're running along. Um, but I, I mean, I appreciate you taking the time to do this. So it's actually it's really important, and I think actually if we, I think we have an opportunity over the next few months to get a, to put a conversation right. That if it does, is going to be extremely productive over the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't belittle the importance of the Van Pool contract. You want to, is this one of those things that if, uh, if Sean were here, he'd be talking about? I gave Sean the night off, but he's back at work, but uh, I feel fully confident to talk about it. I agree. It. <laughs> I know, I agree. Um, so uh, this is something that we're going to ask you to vote on either the next one of the next two meetings. Um, so to make you know, I know just the contractors in here. I want to give it a little bit of um, scope. So Vanpool is um, a company that supports us to um, transport students, uh, mostly students with special needs, to out of district placement. It also does support us with Bikini Bento, which is the Homeless Act, which supports students who. Um, don't live in Amherst but attend our schools as part because they are homeless and so what we've found is they are incredibly flexible they work well with um, some of the students who are struggling the, the most significantly with a whole host of factors they're also frankly the only um, there are other companies that do this but our scale uh, in terms of Hampshire and, and Franklin County is pretty significant and we've had really good good success with them uh, this would be a contract that would extend the con extend the length that we work with Vanpool, and ex in exchange for that, they're offering us a significant reduction on rate. So, uh, as kind of awkward a segue as perhaps it felt like when we talk about um, what our priorities and values are, if we can, we have a vendor that we enjoy and then can save money both in this year's budget and next year's budget. Hence, the push for a vote on the sooner side. Uh, we that's what we're asking you to do because this. To be very blunt about it, this will be a budget cut that has no impact in next year's budget if the committee is amenable and agreeable to um, supporting us to sign the contract. So we are trying to look, given the situation we're in, every single place we can that has no impact on students, this being one of them, or the least amount of impact on students. This one's literally a no impact. This is our current vendor, and we're happy with them. Um, but it does require a vote of the school committee um, that we wouldn't ask you to take um, Certainly, if you feel comfortable taking tonight, we're not going to talk you out of it. But uh, if there are other questions that you want to follow up on, um, I told Dr. Brady to go home given the weather, but she also highly endorses um, the contract and continuing to work with Vanpool. I think particularly uh, noteworthy from Dr. Brady's point of view is their flexibility. Uh, I can think of one situation with all the snow in the winter, because um, I usually don't get super connected to this work uh, where we have um, students in out of district placements that are some distance away and the weather patterns as you know in Massachusetts can vary within our four towns of our region let alone driving to out of district placements and their ability to be in touch with us uh, and be aware of who is delayed who has cancellations what's safe what's not safe in terms of transportation uh, we've been incredibly impressed with their communication uh, with families and with us so that's what we've negotiated with them for your consideration
I'm just upset that you need a fan pool to shuttle homeless kids in place of the boat. Very sober. Yeah. Yes, it is. Are there um, questions? Were you, I mean, were you anticipating, uh, it's our usual practice to discuss one meeting and vote the next. It's, it's certainly up to the committee. It won't throw us off if this gets signed next week. I mean, once it gets signed, we do actually save money in this fiscal year, but we, I'm certainly comfortable putting on the agenda for next week. Even. I mean, I don't think it'll be a long agenda item before we get to budget. Um, it's not going to make or break our budgets if it's delayed a week or two. Or will it entertain a motion? Right. Yeah, I'll move to approve the, um, can I call it the Van Pool contract? Yeah. The Van Pool contract as presented. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there uh, discussion? Yes. Just so, one question on uh, ballpark cost. Mm -hmm. The district is for the lower cost option, but I don't see anything anywhere. So the cost savings for our district would be $20,000 for the next fiscal year. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. So seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of approving the contract as presented, raise your hand. It carries unanimously with, uh, again, one absent for the meeting. By the way, Mr. Sullivan, welcome. Thank you. I mean, we got caught up in a lot of the stuff, so it wasn't never appropriate to say, say you here. Quite all right. Hope the good people of Shootsbury are doing well. I hope they're all upright. <laughs> you heard about your brownies, too. Yeah, we heard you ate great brownies. I'll bring them next week. <laughs> yeah. We'll need them, so. <laughs> I mean, in, in all honesty, I mean, I'll, I'll say it in front of you because I said it without you here, that I was really bummed out. You. Well, the weather was, wasn't permitting you to be here because well, I don't you. really like the idea that we'd have a meeting without, you know, I, either Leverett or Shootsbury present, but I mean, it just doesn't feel good. So I'm glad you're here. Original meeting that broke out under Lawyer Union 26. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone else is lovely too, just fantastic people, but the point is they can't represent Shootsbury. Um, Superintendent Evaluation Subcommittee update. So, were we able to put our document? Yep. <clears throat> um, just if you don't mind, I'll just um, say that this is, we weren't actually able to convene our subcommittee in a timely manner. So this is just thoughts from two of us okay. that we're, we're just throwing out there. That were, they were seen by all, the draft of it was seen by all the is this the same? Do you the funds? We, we, um, <laughs> we, uh, we edited it, the, the substance the but the But, yeah, right. Yes. So, yeah, I'm good with this. Well, I, lights too. <laughs> I mean, let, let's, um, not to sound funny about this, but since there is actually a subcommittee, um, uh, for the purposes of this discussion, um, it's, it's from the two of you, or who's it from? Who wrote it? Um, I drafted it. Phoebe and I have talked about it, and Steve has seen it as well. Yeah, but Audra's seen it as well. I mean, we've seen it to Audra. Seen I, it. We haven't heard from her, so. Well, I know, but it, I mean, it can't, it can't be, you know, unless you've met officially, it can't officially be an act of the committee. Exactly, it's not. So it's I'm just looking, I'm just. some members. Exactly. So let's just yes. leave it, let, that's my point, let's leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> and so would you like to present? Sure. Okay. Um, so this is just pertaining to um, one aspect of the evaluation that we had talked about before, which is, trying to formalize um, guidance on who is going to complete the evaluation each year. <coughs> right? So we, um, we reached out to both Glenn Kucher and Dorothy Presser of MASC, MA, yeah, mm -hmm. MASC um, who both of them shared some thoughts with us mm -hmm. about considerations and options that other schools have entertained, but they, neither one um, were able to kind of point us to any specific protocols or policies that other schools have adopted so we just we had some kind of conversations that helped us think about it um, so some of the things that they mentioned were um, you, school committees consider setting a minimum minimum amount of time that school committees members have served before they do the evaluation um, some committees have thought about requiring that members were present for the goal setting in order to be able to complete the evaluation 
some think about giving guidance to the um, aggregator as to weighting different um, evaluations differently, and I assume that would be one way would be based on the amount of time the person has served. Um, another thing they mentioned was that the evaluation is a public process, so regardless of what you decide to do, all sitting members would have a chance to make comments at that public evaluation. Um, and oh, one kind of note was that regardless of um, uh, uh, somebody's impression before they served, when they if they when they fill out the evaluation, they should just be thinking about um, their observations as a school committee member. So if you have somebody come on late, maybe and haven't served that long, they should still um, you know keep their evaluation pertinent to that their observations as a member. So we um, kind of, in thinking through some of those things, we thought we would just throw out one way to approach it that the committee can discuss, okay. right? And so, Mike, if you can scroll down. We could think about um, making a requirement that school committee, school committee members need to serve for at least six months um, between August 1st and May 31st in order to be eligible to complete the evaluation, even if they're not currently um, a school committee member at the time of the evaluation. And then we would, we were thinking that we would recommend that the aggregator would weight all completed evaluations equally. So and some of our thoughts behind that were um, with a requirement of six months, then anyone completing the evaluation will have been present for at least some of the um, evaluation cycle, some of the milestones like the goal setting and or the mid-year review. Um, and then also thinking through the um, election cycles in the towns, that would mean that um, currently, like uh, members who served from the beginning of the school year and would have com completed the goal setting and the mid-year review and then were not re-elected, would complete the evaluation. The new members wouldn't, and um, if Amherst changes to November elections, then it would be the newly elected person who would end up completing it. And for people who come on board at wonky times, you would just have to do the math. But that would be the outcome, basically. Okay. So. Do you have any other? Comment. Um, so the two things that pop up in my head um, in terms of thoughts, of, you know, uh, one um, is, you know, in terms of observation, um, we typically get artifacts to review, so it's not necessarily me watching the superintendent do his work, um, but it's reviewing the evidence that's provided for each goal. Um, that would be one. Um, and then the other thing is um, in terms of uh, the, as a school committee, as an elected official school committee member, um, one of the things that we get to do is, you know, evaluate. And if the committee decides to deny that, um, or just, you know, like if, if that's not if that person is not participating in the evaluation, does that, can that be challenged in, you know, can that be challenged? Um, and then you're providing somebody who um, is no longer a school committee member the opportunity to do an evaluation. So, so, you're at so, would, so that could be challenged by the superintendent, for example. Um, you know, do you know what I'm saying? Like, if I'm just thinking of case scenarios, if 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 Mr. Demling's term expired, but he can insert his his evaluation, can the superintendent object? Mm -hmm. And can I object if I was just recently elected and I didn't fulfill my six months? Can I say, you know, well, I'm a school committee member. Have a right to evaluate. 
to participate in the evaluation process? And is, are there, you know, would there be challenges to that? So that's my only, those are my feedback, that's my feedback. Ms. Tomini Cage, are you thinking, um, it makes sense to me, by the way, if you were, but it makes sense that we should talk to our attorney and try to get feedback on some of these questions you're raising? That makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, sure. as a baseline, because, I mean, that makes a lot of sense to me. So, uh, should I make this uh, No, Ms. Tomini Cage, cover Okay. By the way, I just to say something positive about what you wrote, um, I, I love the fact that you said you'd want to keep all the evaluations weighted the same. Mm -hmm. So I think it's an absolute, it's, it's a tough enough question to suggest that somebody who's been on the committee for a month or something uh, isn't going to be involved in the evaluation. Although I think, I'd love to know the legal answer to this. Mm -hmm. So I think actually, if somebody's only been on the committee for five or six weeks, it's actually perfectly reasonable to say that they might not participate in the evaluation and that someone who has been on the committee for the majority of the year does. I think the idea that you'd, you'd have two evaluations from people who have legally sat as school committee members and you'd count one as a quarter and one as three quarters or whatever is gets you in ridiculous trouble just as a practical matter. I think, I think waiting them would be a disaster. That's off the cuff, by the way. I'm just, I apologize for just being off the cuff. Do you want to, um, what's, so what's the next step? Right, so what's the next step? So, I mean, I think we put this out here just to start the conversation. You know, obviously the committee could decide as a body that this is completely the opposite of what the majority felt. You know, that that's, but um, this was based on our discussions and sort of our sensibilities. This was something that we put out there. I think that, I think that's a really, really important question. Um, would it be appropriate? I mean, I, I'd be happy to reach out. You can. Okay, then I will do that as our next, as our next step. Yes. Great. And so would it be realistic to suggest that for a meeting in February, we get a revised proposal on this question? Um, Not the question, but like the process. Based on the, the, that legal response. I mean, I can yeah, no, no, totally, process, exactly. I mean, but yeah. everything you learn and stuff like that and yep. share with the committee and come back with a yep. revised. And actually, if you, if you want, you could come back with, you know, if you have, you know, scenario A and scenario B, come back with a couple scenarios that the committee can respond to. Sure. That makes sense. Everyone okay with that? Good. Okay. Um, superintendent goals discussion. So um, I'm going to try to follow the model that I thought worked reasonably well in Pelham, which is, you know, I have a very loose draft. It was emailed late. Sorry, just didn't get to it as early as I'd like today. Uh, you can blame the weather on that as well, for that as well. Um, and I got kind of general feedback, and then some Pelham members have given me individual feedback on the goals for that district. So I don't anticipate, you know, um, certainly can be proven wrong, this being a long agenda item. It's just these are some initial thoughts, here's some initial feedback, but that, that feedback can be continued because likely wouldn't come back to this to the 30th. I'm thinking I wouldn't want to necessarily put a heavy topic on top of the budget for the 23rd. Um, is that okay as a... I'm strongly against putting it on the agenda for the 20th. Uh, right. <laughs> but also just... <laughs> that helps. Well, um, <laughs> but just to get... This is really just an overview of some of sure. the thoughts. And even yeah, just yeah. the conversation we had tonight. I think, it, I think it's healthier be. anyways because, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't... Pardon me for saying this. I don't think we want a dynamic where you're coming in with something you think is fully baked. Yeah. And then saying, what do you think? And then the what you think is, you know, well, I wrote it up already. Here it right. is. You know? Yeah. <laughs> it's far from that. So, yes, um, Mr. This, this might be a really dumb question, but um, what's what's the beginning time frame for these goals that we're discussing? Because I feel like yeah. I feel like we're really late. <laughs> we, we, we are. All right. I mean, it's, this is this is basically a fallout. It's a weird way to talk about this. It's a fallout <laughs> based on her decision to hire Mike as permanent right, superintendent, right. and then negotiate a, a contract. If we hadn't done any of that, uh, we would have had, uh, we've had this conversation months ago. And, and this same thing came up in Pelham as well. I don't want to model everything in the region on Pelham, but I thought it was a very healthy dialogue we had uh, at the Pelham Committee last week. Because um, there's some things on here that you know that I've already done because you've seen them, um, but the work isn't fully complete. And, and uh, I think it is awkward, to Mr. Denling's point, you know, 
this time of year to come up with goals when evaluation is a couple months away. Um, so I made an attempt. I probably wrote too many. Um, but again, it's not baked, whatever the analogy <laughs> is. I'm like, really be careful with that one these days. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, baked like Mr. Sullivan's wonderful. Doesn't, doesn't like anyone around here actually make cookies or something? Mr. The Sullivan. Pies, <laughs> I was no, gonna say, no boxes, it's all scratch. I guess because this doesn't have to be anything untoward about it. Yeah, I'm trying, right? Um, there you go. Next week. So I, maybe I thought I'd just walk through just a minute a piece, just the general thinking, take some uh, the relatively brief feedback because mm. the snow is starting to accumulate. I'm getting some messages, so I want to make sure everyone's safety is. I would say go mind. for it. Yeah. So number <laughs> one, so you've already seen kind of the first draft, got some feedback tonight on a communications plan. Um, and, and so that's up and running and there's there's active work happening and I think it's a critical need in our district. And that's, we talked about that last year with the survey that, would, that happened. So it's nothing new in terms of um, kind of theme, which is a good thing, right? I think sometimes goals should be based on multi-year plans of we did this, we got this data, and now we're doing X and we'll come back and share that. The second one was strategic planning process. One thing that the chair and I have spoken about but I haven't brought with the committee is given the budgetary situation, we pushed the kind of start of that off to later in the spring because starting that, once we start talking about um, budget reductions, felt like the wrong timing to start that process. So we'll start this spring. And to get the, kind of to connect back to what our conversation earlier is, had we get lots of people involved, lots of people not in this room, including SETF, CPAC, two groups that happen to be here today, because um, each of them have met, you know, differently with me uh, at different times with me or Ms. Cunningham and have thoughts about kind of goals in the future that um, need to be integrated into a larger plan. And I, that, so I think the goal that we originally talked about, that being completed in May, uh, I don't think that's feasible given the budgetary situation and how much energy and time and collective, not, not just us, but collectively that's going to take. Um, but I think it's critical and I'm not willing to say that it, it starts in the summer. I think it needs to start this this academic year. The third one is going to be a lot of our work in the next couple months is how do we manage the, these challenges? These challenges are not going away. We'll try to ameliorate them. We're trying to work as best we can, like things like van pool. But the van pool things, frankly, aren't going to get us into seven digits of savings. Um, yeah, those kind of things, they do chip away. They do make a difference. But how do we kind of have these budget challenges, be true to our principles, uh, and also invest resources towards sustain long-term sustainability because if we look at this as a one-year budget challenge and the chair has alluded to this a couple times tonight we're going to be in one-year budget challenges every year how do we look at how do we manage this challenge with an eye towards future years and future challenges and that will be it's already taking up um, a lot of our collective energy as it should and, and that'll continue four five and six is, is things where I'm not sure you know and, and can think about this a little differently to not have Maybe there's a larger umbrella that can be done, maybe not. Um, but the Alana Cabinet, we've spoken about the racial equity professional learning community that, that kind of drew out of the Undoing Racism workshop that AEF funded, that many of our staff and Ms. Cunningham were involved in. Um, you know, really building a successful, and the key word here is differentiated social justice professional development. Um, we're, we're starting with a day or half day in March and then also looking to have a more uh, long term vision of what that is. And this day in March both has content, but it's also going to give us kind of what we would call in education circles formative feedback or formative assessment of where are we as a district, what directions do we need to go in, and how do we kind of formulate a plan that's not just kind of, again, professional development by professional development day by professional development day, but much more holistic and long-ranging on those efforts. The fifth one, uh, it's not in the SETF document, but it's certainly been some of the dialogue that it had, and we do, we are, um, some of this was informed by our workshop in California in the fall that we spoke about, is the school climate survey that'll serve as a baseline. We, our plan is to do annual school climate surveys. We've gotten some feedback from staff and other stakeholders, and we want to implement that uh, to form a baseline and then commit to do that each year. Um, with, you know, there may be some slight variation based on the feedback we get of how it goes, but to have longitudinal data on school climate, I think it actually, while not explicitly mentioned in the SCHDF document, I think it informs a lot of um, some of the critical features of that uh, at all three of our secondary schools. Um, and the last one is um, really around the hiring and retention. So, you know, being that I'm evaluating the spring before all the hiring decisions are made, we're trying to think about how do we actually sort of define that we're doing a lot of work on this without it being, you know, you get into the end of the year and say, okay, where's the proofs in the pudding? And we say we're still in that hiring cycle. So uh, we still are working for wording. I think Doreen did a great job trying to figure that out, which is cultural refinement. So 
Um, and some of that's working with the Alana cabinet because one is a two subsets. Alana cabinet decided to break into two groups. One is working very much on the PD and there's assisting uh, Ms. Cunningham, Mr. Sheehan on the planning of that. Another is working directly with me on this culture piece um, and um, how, do we, how do we actively work on that and see ourselves as a district where staff members will encourage other staff members to come because it's a supportive environment. It's a little harder to measure, um, so I need to think a little bit more about that, but these were the six thoughts I had in my head as things that were tangible, that we're actively working on, that are, in our estimation, critically important for this spring. Mr. As succinct as I can do it, sorry. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> um, one thing I'd, I'd like you to give some thought to is, is, is in terms of um, how you manage your these goals as an effective guideline document and, and the SETF goals because when I, the first time I read this I look at two four five and six and there's immediate parallels to a number of the goals I mean, again I don't have the memo in front of me from SETF but from what was discussed and so um, and Mr. Johnny Cage talked about possibility of written response a living document and then in parallel we have the superintendent's goals right. going on at the same time so. I worry a little bit about yeah. too many goals mm -hmm. going on, mm -hmm. and, and so uh, it, is there a possibility of merging some of these? Um, how would that look like? Mm -hmm. You know, with, without um, without collapsing one. So I, I don't I don't know how you do that, um, but just in terms of what's efficient for you, and, and uh, as an effective public transparency document, right. just to get some thought to that. I, I, the, the other comment I had, I don't know if this is something that would rise to the level of a superintendent goal. This level, but um, we heard about it in the co-teaching presentation tonight, this need for increased teacher collaboration. Yeah. And it really struck a chord with me, because when I think about the many presentations I've now seen on school committee and the others that I've attended in public, uh, along with just money and budget, the need and time for teacher, the need for teacher collaboration and that sort of joint time right. um, uh, as a variable that affects positive outcomes. It, it just keeps coming up again and again. It, it came up during the IMP implementation with MAP. MAP um, it came up with um, the schedule change at the middle school. Um, and again and again, you know, when I read research articles, it's what are the things that associate with outcome? And it seems like a huge factor for the way administrators support teachers. Now, obviously, that's all, also tied to budget. <laughs> but, um, you know, I don't know if, if, if you could maybe get that thought about how that would look like for people. Um, kind of thinking from the sub evaluation subcommittee perspective, um, we should evaluate on the four standards. And I'm just wondering, mm. is there a standard one instruction? You asked this question in column two. I know. You're, you're, I appreciate that. Uh, you're right. Uh, both places. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. No. no. Yeah. Um, so uh, what's not on here? Um, particularly um, a lot of these are standards three and four and less so standards one and two um, and I will look at that and try to figure out how to resolve that because I don't want to have an evaluation with half of the elements um, half of the standards let alone elements not represented I'll say that um, you know, some can be weighted more than others, and I think this is what's happening. If you think about tonight's earlier conversation, it really wasn't across necessarily all four standards. Um, so, um, but nonetheless, it's a really good piece of feedback that I'll work on. Cesar? Um, yeah, so I really appreciate, I think these goals are, you know, ambitious and based in reality, which is uh, great. I'm just look, thinking about you know, in lieu of the discussion we've had earlier today with number four, and maybe this is already part of the sort of plan or idea around this one, um, but this idea of, of of really getting a baseline around where our professional development is already, could that be mm -hmm. baked in, <laughs> if you will? You know, like ha have, I mean, I think it would be ex extremely helpful to have come out of it, like this is really where we are in terms of what we do year to year. Well, here's the here's the, I picture, you know, a big map of our professional development, all the different ages, how is it hitting the different, the different, um, you know, teaching cohorts throughout from K to pre-K to 12. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't know if that fits with, but to me that seems like that would be a, a helpful piece. Um, and I think number six, I mean, you, you said it, but 
when I read culture refinement, I sort of have a sense of maybe what you mean, but mm -hmm. could what I don't know how, but could that be stated in a way that was a, you know specific? What, what it, mm -hmm. how, how could you get more specific about that so we really understand what it is that we're assessing and we're looking mm -hmm. at looking for? That's helpful. Thank you. So I have, I have a question actually that goes with that. Um, when you're looking at uh, these goals, do you have already sort of a broader thematic objective that that this nests under? And the reason I the reason I say that is one could imagine uh, that if you said to support the objective of doing X and Y and Z, uh, my goal for this year is to do these three specific things. Mm -hmm. uh, that would that would be helpful because I mean if that makes sense right. to you that would be helpful only because it would it would provide clarity about what are what activities are being done but then how do these activities nest within a, a broader objective and I'm saying that partially because it might be easier to figure out how to write sentence six for example item six mm -hmm. if you weren't packing so many concepts into a really succinct sentence <laughs> and you just I'm not sure if I'm not in front of it I mean it's I think it's a good effort yeah. but I'm saying if you pull out here's what we're trying and it kind of echoes something that Mr. Demling said earlier is that um, I think it might even be I'm not I'm not, I'm not just trying to bake in uh -huh. the SETF goals but I think the interesting element about how that document was written that I actually kind of liked is the first sent the first sentence topical sentence was sort of this broad objective right. and then underneath it there were some specific mm -hmm. things that were being done mm -hmm. and I just think there's some utility to that right because it actually it helps people focus their mind on what are we act what am I actually trying to accomplish or what are we trying to actually accomplish right. and then here are the things we're trying to do that that get there yeah I think uh, in a in a different context uh, I'm quite envious of that I think uh, of doing that and so the short answer to your question in terms of theming is the way I frame it is what's new, what's continuing work, and what are we actually implementing and mm -hmm. wanting to be, nothing's ever done but done. Yeah, so yeah. when I, that's how I'm trying to view a form, I mean, I know it's over the year, but I'm trying to view it as, you know, it's mid-January, these will be hopefully voted, presented and voted in late January. Um, at that point, in terms of the kind of 12 months of the academic year, you know, from, from Ju July 1st, right, we're, we're two-thirds in. You know, right. or a little more than, you know, I think it's about right, two-thirds. So uh, when the communication plan, that's, a, that's certainly something we've talked about, but it's very new for the district, right? We haven't had a communication plan. We've talked about, um, when I think about strategic planning, that's also new. Uh, when we get down to some of the other ones, they're really continuing work. So climate survey we've done before. We've been in this kind of dialogue, how often should it be? And, mm -hmm. And can we have longitudinal data? So for me, that's implementing. Like we went, we went to a right. conference, we got good feedback, we've now vetted it, we've had staff vet it, right? So that's sort of an implement, you know, and it's a longer term implementation because it's not just a one year. The, the commitment is that it becomes part of our annual practice. So I tried to mix things that were kind of more new to things that kind of were old hat and we've talked about them for a while. And then there's stuff like three and four that are sort of in the middle, right? We've had budget challenges before. I think this is sort of a unique year um, of budget challenges, uh, both in terms of where the challenges are coming from and also the, the sheer quantity of challenge and the lack of clarity we're receiving. Hopefully things will improve about four member towns and agreeing on assessment methodology. We've been in that this boat before, but not quite this boat. We've been in a similar looking boat, um, but not the same one. So I tried to mix things that were really new and things that were like done. We could say at the end of the year we completed this task um, with ones that were going to continue into next year because you know what I would anticipate is next year's goals will be much more comprehensive and mm -hmm. kind of further reaching. Hopefully we'll get there like in September. That would be the goal um, to have for, for me is that we have goals approved if not sooner. Um, so that's a little do, bit do of Do you see thing. four, five, and six as being re related in terms, like if you if you looked at, at this at from thirty thousand feet, right. what are we trying to accomplish? Mm -hmm. um, that there's a relationship between those goals. I do, and, and that's I'm struggling. We talked about a little this afternoon. We're struggling a bit with what to include in this document and what, you know, to Mr. Demling's point that you were commenting on, yeah. what what goes into more kind of a connection to SETF goals and reporting back to it. Um, I think if there was one that I felt frankly, less 
committed to in terms of being on a goals document, it'd probably be number six, not because I'm not committed to the task, because I think it's hard to measure, and um, I think it can be part of a larger effort, and frankly, because at the regional level, we're just not going to do much hiring this year. So it does, it's not to say that we shouldn't look at the culture and how people are experiencing it, but in terms of hiring and um, retention, a lot of that's going to be driven by factors outside the control and commitments that uh, we have. We but isn't, isn't, forgive me for asking as a problem in a second, mm -hmm. isn't, isn't number four part, not that's not the only objective, right. but isn't a significant outcome or objective of item number four improving the retention of diverse individuals as part of the workforce? So, or does that mean something totally different? Yeah. Um, so I, I went not on the hiring side, but on our retention side. Right. I, I think that's, yeah, I think it can be woven into number four in that way, but I, I, I think the primary, my primary outcome, sorry, I'm not letting you yeah. jump in. Uh, <laughs> for that is not quite that. I wouldn't say we're doing professional development to increase retention. It's, I think we're doing professional developments to best prepare our teachers to effectively work with a diverse student body. So an outcome of that can be, in terms of the way that we're going about it, in terms of including many staff members of color as well as white allies in the work, is an attempt to do that. But in terms of the actual PD, um, so I, I, I don't want to make go long-winded on it, but I think I could figure out ways to integrate those to make it more succinct and um, more clear. So, I mean, I this, um, I can look at this and see some of the evidence that you're doing to to make progress in some of these goals. Um, for example, um, I could see for number six um, the grant that came out of the district to support professional development for. Um, paraprofessionals that are already mm -hmm. in our district right. to become licensed teachers, classroom teachers. I think that's, you know, um, something that I could see fit there. And I could very easily see some of the um, school equity task force, um, you know, how what we're doing as a district to make progress towards some of those goals as, you know, very, you know, belonging in, in here as well. So I, I think. I think there's many things that already fit here that we're, um, you know, doing. Um, you know, like the regionalization grant that was um, for the study that that was awarded um, fits in with number. Um, you know, the budget. You know, supporting mm -hmm. three. Three, right? I mean, it's pretty easy. Um, so, but I, I, I think, I think that. I don't know, um, yeah, so, so there's, there's, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's, um, these things are, I, I think they, they could be aligned, like, uh, not aligned, but, but I, I think it could reflect, right, the, 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 expectations that have been put out there already um, that we could say that yeah the, the superintendent you know is committed and is making you know steady progress or that's where I think that's where I, th I, I think that's where I think on some of this ju being just thinking when you're coming back with it yeah. of simplifying some of the language yeah. in ways that sort of echo or map to some of those, without I mean, being overly wordy, right. would probably be helpful. Just because mm -hmm. I think it, as sort of a as a public as a document. Now I know you're being evaluated on it, but it also ends up being right. sort of a publicly faced document. Um, you don't want to make it too hard on people to figure out what you're saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, Ms. Cunningham. Oh no, I agree. Um, when I look at number four, I just looked at that as something where we're increasing the knowledge and understanding of our staff, right? Mm -hmm. And number six. Going to uh, Mr. Monty Cage's point, when we look at the PARA grant that was written, we know that the focus group brought to our attention that there were PARAs and individuals who did not feel accepted within the district or did not feel like they were equal with the teachers and or part of the staff. Therefore, number six was more where we would embark on trying to help make it a more inclusive environment mm -hmm. so that we're retaining. So if we put, move aside the word hiring 
it's the retention and the making the um, the staff feel more welcome mm -hmm. as part of our community and with what we're doing and that they're supported so not just mentoring and, and offering those things but removing whatever barriers they feel mm -hmm. are keeping them away from being more um, included in our school system so that's that's what I was looking at with number six and yes we can make it more specific to um, include some of the SETF goals and where it can be measurable I think so, by the way I apologize when I when I was looking at item four I think I obviously just misunderstood or actually don't have any understanding of what a racial equity professional learning community is because that sparked in my mind more peer-to-peer -peer learning among teachers or staff than it did or educators than it did necessarily between educators and students and so if it's professional development to improve practice like in classroom or school that affects the learning environment that makes total sense to me it's just that literally when I read that that term of art it it made me think more of six than it did of four, and so it's my own ignorance. Mm -hmm. I'm proud to declare publicly on camera. Mr. Yes. <laughs> um, I actually had read it very similar to you, so um, I will include myself in that. Um, I, first, I, I just want to say thank you for preparing all of this and also for working in collaboration with Ms. Cunningham um, to develop these. Um, it's really helpful to see your thinking and also to invite feedback at this stage as opposed to waiting towards the end. <laughs> um, one thing that I would, I would encourage you to think about is providing some continuity from year to year on your goals. So that I see here, you know, when I, when I think back really hard, because it was a whole like nine months ago, <laughs> um, to the previous goals that we approved, um, the, the communications plan in the Alana cabinet, of course, were two of the things that, you know, that were incorporated in there. But I think even just using language like, you know, building upon, you know, um, the continuing goal of improving communications for the district, right, or building upon the continuing goal of professional development among uh, diverse, you know, educators, et cetera, uh, would help us see some of that continuity, right, and be able to evaluate your progress based on that. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, I think a lot of this, um, I, I agree completely with a lot of the, the comments that have been made about incorporating the SETF goals into these and trying to figure out ways to maybe uh, be a little more clear. Yeah. Um, and then also, you know, while staying in alignment with the recommendations from, you know, the, the, the evaluation tools that we've, we've previously looked at. Uh, but I, I would be looking at for continuity in these uh, because that is sort of the way that I think about evaluating progress is just, you know, yeah. how, how well are we doing from year to year, not just are we coming up with a new set of goals every single time. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. So, um, last chances to comment before we move on our agenda. Can I say one very quick? Totally. Maybe so I was a asking little bit for. Dumb, but yeah. for number three, um, I would state what the core mission is. I would mm -hmm. state it directly because mm -hmm. if this is a, you know, public document, I think it, it sounds a little soft to just say the permission. I think you get mm -hmm. more substance if you stay with this. Personal. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I like what Dr. Faye Brady um, brought up in terms of um, bringing it back and centering it to the students, that everything, like all the goals somehow should be connected to um, serving our students. So making that perhaps more explicit or connected, mm -hmm. that would be wonderful. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. We could make this a lot more challenging if we keep going, by the way. <laughs> it's really helpful feedback. So. So that's something nice to think about a little in the budget, right? It is. <laughs> it is. Uh, okay, next. Um, do we have getting gifts, by the way? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, sabbatical request. Yep. Um, you want to initiate this? Discussion? Yeah, if that's okay. So yes. just for people who haven't uh, went through this before, we're using the same process that we've used previously. And so that process generally involves that uh, we do get sabbatical requests. It's in the teacher's contract, um, and those processes are followed. It goes to Ms. Ms. Moreland, uh, who send, forwards it to me. I meet with the person who sent the sabbatical application, um, ask them some clarifying questions, uh, then meet with the chair of the relevant committee to share uh, my thoughts and talk through with him or he or she about that. I then come to the committee for with a recommendation for your consideration. Um, and then um, you can ask me any questions and, and, and then a vote occurs. I think uh, just as a caveat, because we've mentioned budget a couple times, there are contractually some reasons where my dis um, dissertations, 
um, sabbaticals can get approved or not approved. Budget is not one of them. Mm -hmm. So with this good budget pay year, bad budget year, that can't be a reason to either approve or not approve a sabbatical request. If it's a great year, hypothetically, and uh, we haven't experienced many of those, but and you say, oh, well, we've got money to burn, right? That can't be a reason. And on the flip side, in a challenging budget year, we can't say, oh, looks fantastic, we just can't afford it. I think, no. But the key thing is I didn't hear from anything we met. No. You never raised that as a consideration at all. Absolutely. You're and saying I, it's it's not supposed to be part of the process, but also it wasn't. It wasn't, yeah. I just want to say that sure. for people who haven't been through this before. Um, absolutely, but to Ms. Narcuba's point. So um, I did meet with the, per and, it, and I also want to say, and I said this, you know, this comes up every year, it's awkward to talk about it. We have a staff member who's put a lot of time and effort, whether to support them or not, and, you know, I always let them know it's going to be on the agenda in January if they would like to come. They, they, you know, and it has to be. Yes, right. Yeah, and it's so just the, point it's is just the nature of it. Um, and everyone's always been very respectful, and I don't anticipate any challenges with that. Um, so I met with the applicant. It was in the packet. Um, my professional opinion is there's a lot of value in the, particularly the experience she would like to have, um, the travel. Um, she has, with students, it's a course that's, that is, as noted in the application, it's true, a very um, popular English class for um, upper level students at our secondary school. I think there's a lot of value in uh, the approach she takes in terms of instruction as well as um, really getting deeper into, in this current context, uh, going to Alabama and learning from the history, which is different than reading about it. At the same time, um, when we think about the kind of balance we have for a sabbatical request, for me, as much as I appreciated the effort, and I did have this conversation with the applicant, I think there are ways to perhaps achieve the goal that she is citing of integrating um, the museum and, and those pieces, perhaps even having a student trip, without having a full sabbatical offered. Um, typically, what I look for in a sabbatical is really clarity on what that time will be used for, how it will be used, and how it will benefit, how it'll benefit students. And uh, when I read this, I, I saw a great idea that perhaps is implementable on a scale without a full sabbatical. Um, and, and I had that conversation with the staff member. Uh, I was pretty explicit about it. Um, and so my recommendation to the committee would be that the um, twofold. One is that sabbatical is not not, um, I wouldn't recommend supporting the sabbatical, and I would recommend encouraging me or tasking me with going back to meet with the staff member to see what ways can we still support the work that she wrote about in the proposal to see what's possible sans uh, a full sabbatical. So that's, that's my two cents on it, and certainly I shared that with the chair when we met. Right, and when we had our, our conversation, um, I generally concurred with both points, meaning not simply on the sabbatical, um, but also uh, the idea that there are things of, of deep value in here that I think would be fantastic if they could find ways to support alternatively, including potentially a student trip down to the museum. I think that'd be uh, terrific. Mr. Um, just in general, you have to cite hard stuff. <coughs> Like, how, how often are sabbaticals approved, or, and how, like, how many applicants do we get typically? And yeah. I, just, I just want to get some general sense of Yeah, I'm sorry. I meant to mention that at the beginning when I was talking about the process. I apologize. So uh, we've had kind of a low of zero to a high of, you know, I think there was one year we had five applications. Um, I think, you know, in the three, four years I've been close to it, I think our uh, approval rate has been 50%, maybe a little below. Um, depends on the district because Amherst has its own set of applications, and even though the contract language is the same, I'm probably merging some of that in my head. Um, so I think it's a, a very rigorous high bar, um, both in terms of the value to students and also the um, kind of the high value of having someone be gone for a semester because there's separate from any of the financial pieces. These are valued staff members we want to support in terms of their professional development, and we want to really ensure we're providing um, it when only when kind of we can link and see a one-to-one -one correspondence between the sabbatical and, and the student learning piece. Um, and so every applicant that comes in, for me in the last two years, two and a half years, um, that's come in, I always ask, if the sabbatical is not supported, what would be the plan, right? And it's not because I've, I've made no decision of recommendation at that point, but I'm always trying to figure out how do I support this staff member regardless, because I don't know what the committee will do. Um, and uh, I do, it, I, do, I did have that conversation with the applicant. I do believe there are ways we can actively support the experience for her and for students, perhaps without the full semester sabbatical. Um, but I, I would say the 
average over, I can only go back the last three or four years, is, is below 50%. Further questions? I don't have a question. I have um, a comment. Um, I just want to say that I, my daughter took this class, and as part of her parent IEP, I read everything that she reads, and the reading material was amazing. Yeah. It, it really was. It, all, all the books, yeah. uh, everyone, everyone should read them. I'd actually love to know sometime what are the books in the African American literature class, and this is out of a selfishness because uh, an exceptionally long time ago in a galaxy, actually right here, um, uh, I, uh, I took the African American literature class with um, the teacher who was then in charge, Connie Matthews, and uh, it was easily one of the best courses and most, most influential courses I took while at Amherst High School. Uh, and um, I, I experienced probably some overlap in books and maybe some differences in books. Uh, the same sort of experience that they were uh, extraordinary literature profoundly moving in the interweaving of, of history, culture, and, and literary arts, I thought was uh, exceptional at the time being, and I'm sure it still is exceptional. It is, yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, uh, sorry to riff on it for a second, but open the door a little bit. Um, think about, you know, one of the SETF goals around um, courses and what courses we have that talk about um, equity and, and, you know, we could perhaps for another meeting, maybe we'll schedule this on January 30th, um, you know, to look at what our course, our current courses are now and where the strands are, not as saying we've got it all figured out, but to understand the current context. And I think this is a good example of a course that's incredibly popular and meaningful for students, as Mr. Selvin and Mr. Nakajima pointed out. Um, and how do we, I love it that our teachers are continually looking to how do we enhance that experience, right? Not being saying, oh, it's great, it's a good, wonderful experience, really popular. What's the next step in my work? What's the next step that we can offer students? And I just want to kind of cite that admirable. Right. Spirit. So I have an awkward question. Do we need we need to vote on this? I prefer. Yes, you do contractually. Okay. No, I, yeah. that's a straightforward <laughs> answer. You start to see like you prefer that we do, and it's like no, dude, it's not a preference. We have to do it. Um, Ms. Hazard and then Mr. McKinney. Just want to make just a quick comment that I you know I read through this and I. I looked at the links that were provided, and I just, you know, I mean, I was just really, you know, it's a very impressive of the, um, the passion and depth and caliber that we're seeing coming out of our high school. I mean, it just really is yeah. staggering. So I, I, I want to express that, you know, my, my appreciation for the kind of work that's happening in this particular individual and what, what that's bringing to our students. Um, and I, I do hope that we can, you know, there's a way that this, this kind of work can be supported because this is not, you know, this is not an area of history and literature that I was aware of as sort of an emerging, really important, um, really important uh, piece that, to be, that is being brought to our students. Yeah, so much Cage. Um, is this, um, would, so the, the individual has a, is trying to pursue a degree, a doctorate, or? Or what? How is what's the educational level? So, or I, is there a, a goal? Here? So I think her goal. I don't think it was about her educational level uh, in a, terms of letters. Um, when I met with her, it was really focused on how does she enhance the work that she does with students um, in her courses, not just her upper grade course, but also the ninth and tenth grade required English courses. So I don't think there was. Um, I didn't receive any focus from my meeting with her that this is uh, focused on professional advancement in that regard, but I think it was more about professional advancement in terms of the practice and the curriculum that she brings to students on a daily basis. Because typically um, some people take sabbaticals to, to you know, get through their... Yeah, their, that, their degrees. Yeah. I'd say that's more the... Ex I can only, again, my history of this probably only goes back realistically about six years since I was more aware of it. Um, I think that's more the exception than the rule. Um, I think there was one individual whose application both met the professional development needs or light, um, degree that she was focusing on, but there was a be dual benefit to the district as well. I, I'd say that I can't think of many other examples that match that serendipitous one that I think we're referring to. And, and to be clear, you, you think that the district can still support the work? 
that's what I would, I mean, my conversation with the author of the application, uh, I think we had a good dialogue and we need to continue about how to, how to fully support the work, but I do feel confident that we can figure out a way to support the work. Yes. Okay. So I'd accept a motion. Okay, I, I personally will offer a motion for the committee that uh, I move to decline approval of the sabbatical request as contained in our packet. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Um, I think the I think the committee members have all expressed you you had asked us. I want to appreciate the fact, Superintendent, that you asked us to encourage you to find a way to support the work. You didn't have to push very hard to hear from pretty much everyone that we would encourage you to find a way to support <laughs> the work, as well as also that we have a great deal of admiration um, for the work of this teacher and for the, the course. It's, I mean, my experience for the course itself, uh, it's been a valuable one for a long time, but I'm sure it still is fantastic. It is, yeah. and Better than ever. Any further discussion? Um, yes. Just this. one comment. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I. I thought long and hard about this um, this application, and I also clicked through the links and everything, and I felt um, in some ways um, applications for sabbaticals sometimes benefit from being a little more general and a little bit more expansive because it allows for, instead of a sort of a, a predetermined decision about what it is that you're going to learn, that you are opening yourself up to the experience and saying, I'm going to you know, bring back as much information and learning as I possibly can to the school or the environment where I'm where I'm currently working. Um, and I feel like, you know, and, and I'm saying this out loud because I think it, it may be if, you know, I don't know if others would be in agreement with me or not, but from my perspective, um, a, an application like this would probably be more successful if it had been about going down to live in the South for some time and maybe work or study among um, you know, African American communities with experience in dealing with uh, either desegregation efforts you know, and or some of the, the lynching uh, trials that happened um, that were also you know, working perhaps the, um, they mentioned the Civil Rights Museum here, but just a, a combination of different experiences um, and sort of pulling together as broad you know a an experience as possible to bring back then to students here at Amherst High School I feel like that may you know again from my perspective be more successful and be more um, in alignment with a lot of the other uh, requests for sabbaticals that we've seen previously and I'm thinking specifically about you know the the, the one um, teacher who we approved last year to go and, and um, spend some time in the sort of that, that um, the acting and, and uh, you know sort of educational um, theater group um, and the other uh, teacher at the elementary level who went to Finland. Um, these are broader experiences, right? That you, you get so much from that experience, and you can bring that back to your students. So I just wanted to say that I think this is this is a, a you know a remarkable attempt at trying to get a very specific piece of history and information which would definitely benefit um, the reading of students in, in literature, um, but perhaps a little too specific, more about a research type project, you know, and um, maybe maybe someday in the future come back and look at it in a slightly different way. Yeah, and I think one thing, whatever your vote is, is, you know, one thing that I did last year and I was I plan to do this year is share some of the general feedback. Mm -hmm. Certainly someone could watch a video, but because yeah. um, some peop people do want to apply yeah. again. Um, and, and I do that in my individual meetings with them, you know, um, and I share that feedback, which I won't share publicly because I feel like that would not be fair. Um, but that's really helpful. All the feedback has been very helpful for me, whichever way the vote goes. Thank you. Right. Any further discussion? I just have a quick yes, question. Yes, Sullivan. Did, how many applied this year? This is the only option. This is the only one? In the in and so, because yeah. there were two or three strong ones last year and they chose not to get the floor. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, so we have a motion to decline approval of the sabbatical request uh, without further discussion. All those in favor of that motion, please signify by, aye by raising your hand. 
Okay. It's uh, unanimous. Thank you. But with all the comments you've already got. Absolutely. Which I think many of them are very positive. Um, so who wants to raise their hand to read gifts? Somebody who hasn't spoken much today, perhaps? Ms. Hazard? I can do it. <laughs> I don't know if I've spoken enough. Um, it's okay. pretty equal today, actually. It I think. feels pretty equal. Um, so I move to approve the following gifts from the ARHS PGO, Lawrence Bank number 189555 on um, behalf, let's see, not sure what. Oh, this is all the same one, yeah. On behalf of the Help for People Foundation, Robert J. Lyons, to support the ARHS uh, Principal Discretion Fund, a total of $15,000. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there a comment? Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of accepting the gift, please raise your hand. It is unanimous. Um, so next meeting is going to be all budget we are going to talk about uh, the four town meeting and other things so bring your questions bring your comments bring your thoughts bring your thinking caps all the above uh, Mr. Demling. Um so it does not have to be anytime soon but yeah. um, we had talked at one point about um, as we set the future agendas sure yeah some sort of item queue because sometimes I'll I, I, feel, um, I feel like I'm asking too much of the chair Either this chair or the other chair. Yeah. Um, when I'm, I'm bringing up an item a second or third time, when it's probably already on your radar for a future meeting. But yeah. Because we don't have multiple agendas, so just some sort of like it's not yet on an agenda, but we haven't forgotten about it. List. Yeah. I, mean, I <laughs> think I think there's I think there's two things. I mean, one we've tried. To, we probably need to do this again sometime in the near future. Is we've tried to create sometimes dummy schedules for out, out meetings where. Um, where some of the items just listed on the out meetings is saying, we can't get it here, we're going to get it here, we can't get it here, we're going to get to there. I think I think if there are some items that seem to be falling out of that, then there ought to be a running list of, of topics we need to get to underneath it. I'll give you an example of one, because I don't think we've shared anything on about the January 30th, right? Um, we got to get going on our new member orientation mm -hmm. packets. So, it's one of my so the funny thing is that's actually on the January 30th, you guys, you guys don't know this yet, but it is actually on the January 30th agenda because we simply have to talk about that and more importantly get to work on it if it's ever going to make any use of anyone <laughs> in the future, right? Um, so yeah, we can do we can do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, meaning topics of near-term meetings we have scheduled and then a running list. Yeah. yeah. And, and you don't have to feel like you have to segment it that granular a level if, if it's too much just even just a straight up list just so I don't feel like I'm bothering you with something. no I, I, I these could be two different things then because okay. my point simply is if if I don't this is gonna sound dumb but if like there's a running list of things we should get to but I already know that one of the things on the running list is scheduled for like February 13th right. I'd rather tell you what's scheduled for February right. 13th than you to say hey why isn't that it's on the list but what's it gonna uh, you know, you know, it just seems to, it makes my life easier, frankly, and maybe Mike's. If if there is, if we have an indication we can deal with someone at a certain point, tell you, and then if it's on the rest of the list, then it means, um, you know, yell louder, and we'll find some way. To, you know, we'll just meet till eleven. Um, is are we in planning? We are in planning. Yeah. Okay. Sure. And I, can I just follow up with that? I, yeah. I, this is just a brainstorm because I'm thinking, where could that list be? Because we can't, we don't really have a spot, you know, where everybody can just reference. <coughs> so I'm just thinking about that because that uh -huh. would be great if you could just click on something and check and see what's there. But could maybe it could be that at, on every agenda and packet is included, you know, the list or something like I that. Wouldn't, so I wouldn't mind if every, like if that. every, I wouldn't well, mind I still if, have another comment too before. I wouldn't <laughs> mind if every, no, I was going to say, I wouldn't mind if every agenda packet we actually have, and forgive me for being beating a dead horse on what I would prefer to do, is have an list, uh, a list of topics for, for identified meetings and then a running list of things that are topics yeah. that have come up. Mm -hmm. Something that's just a regular So a little bit of both. We just have it at the back of the packet every meeting. So the other, totally unrelated, is um, it was just brought to my attention, and I know that we talked about this sometime recently, was having a student rep on the yeah. school committee 
Do we have that on the or what, how we might make it? It's, it's been a work in progress. Okay. Yeah. So um, I know Mr. Jackson's been in touch with Ms. Haygood, who does do next, you met Ms. Haygood mm -hmm. late at night. Um, <laughs> and she's wonderful, and so she, they've engaged in a process to solicit people, right. students who are interested, um, and that process I hopefully wrap up in the next two weeks. Excellent, thanks. So that is that is something that has been progress. Yes, Mr. Donnelly. Another completely unrelated that we don't have to decide on tonight, but just for yeah. us to give us some thought. Um, we currently have a school committee meeting scheduled for March 27th, which is going to be a date of some import in Amherst. <laughs> in fact, it will be very strange because uh, new school committee members will be voted on if we have a meeting in the middle of the meeting. <laughs> so I don't know if we want to move that in a day or not something we have to decide. I'm fine with it. I'll leave in the middle of the day. Mike, let's just look at it. He's like, early about retirement. It. I mean, it's, it, it, A, they can't be sworn in that fast, and you know better than that. So you're stuck being there in the meeting. You can't leave halfway, whether or not Steve brings brownies. And, um, and uh, B, just as a practical matter, more for the Amherst members than others, there may be people who have particular passions that are being served that evening. And so... We might want to move the date if we can, just yeah. right. so that we don't get into a situation where, I don't know, people are too busy working their smartphone, figuring out how vote totals have gone instead of paying attention to the important pieces at hand. We can figure that out, right? We'll figure that out. Sorry, Amherst meeting. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, right. Feedback. All right, so we're done, right? Yeah. I got okay. two, is there a move two to quick things. Oh, sure. I'm sorry, Steve. That's quite all right. The first one is um, I, I missed the last meeting. But I want to thank all those committee members that asked questions of the IMP presentation because they were some of my questions. Right. And I appreciate everyone asking them. And the other one is thank you to Dr. Michael Morris, the superintendent, for traveling up the hill to Shootsbury with Principal Jackson and Principal Bodie because it, it turns out that the um, feedback I've gotten quite a bit of feedback from people that weren't there that just appreciated the fact that there were representatives that made the trip up the hill because it usually happens at um, town meeting. And that's wonderful. Yeah. That's great. And as I mentioned before you were here, you set the bar very high for Leverett with the um, snacks and home oh, I'll bring goods. I'll, I'm happy to bring them snacks. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> I'll try and bridge that. Before you became Mike was um, waxing poetic about how much he absolutely loved the Shootsbury meeting. So yeah. the, the feeling was mutual. Yeah. And I really appreciate, you know, I said this before, but you weren't here, but I want to say it with you here. I know it's late. It's just I appreciate that you came and introduced the meeting. I think it, you know, really, I didn't say this explicitly, it really mattered that the Shootsbury rep on the regional school committee was introducing the meeting instead of um, staff members, and, and I saw that in that, the response of the folks who were there. So thank you very much for that. Well, you're welcome. I've been dreaming of that meeting since <laughs> I was doing daycare in 2001. <laughs> wow. Wow. Well, that's cool. That's you got to really find neat. another dream now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to bask in that one for a while. You should. You should. So, Steve, I guess since you're, you're speaking anyways, I'd like you to give me a motion. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> First thing I'll make no a motion more. to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. It's moved and seconded. All those in favor? It is unanimous. We're adjourned. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Amherst Media. And drive safe, please. Thank you. Oh, yeah.